Good afternoon. Welcome. This is the Marion City Council work session for Tuesday, June 5th. Okay. First on our agenda, we have a presentation from the police department in four hours. So. We actually have three, so now we've got to load this. You do, one back to back. All right. Mayor, yes, Mayor. we also had a special item that we were going to vote on tonight. Um, there was a special agenda. Um, do we have that? The Marion by Moonlight Hold Harmless. Yeah, I remember that. First page. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh. We could do a roll call and that, then vote on that. Do you want us to do that first? Yeah, if we could do a roll call and then um, okay. do that Okay, so item. let's do roll call. Mr. Draper. Here. Ms. Etzel. Present. Mr. Jensen. Here. Mayor Abawasili. Here. Ms. Gedalia. Here. Mr. Brandt. Here. Mr. Sternad. Present. Okay. So, um, yeah, we'll proceed with, with uh, the item on the agenda for, for voting. So. Hey, Your Honor, I'd like to make a motion to approve the following Hold Harmless Noise Waiver Agreement. Marion by Moonlight at the Marion Square Park, June 7th, 14th, 21st, and 28th of 2018, from 6.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m., Timothy Lane, Farmer State Bank, 1240 8th Avenue. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded <coughs> to approve the Hold Harmless Noise Waiver Agreement for Marion by Moonlight at, in Marion Square Park for June 7th, 14th, and 21st, and 28th, 2018, from 6.30 till 9.30 p.m. Discussion? This happens, we do this every year, right? This yeah. is a... Mm -hmm. We were just late, they were late this yeah. year. Coming in to work out. Yeah, okay. Okay. No further discussion? All those in favor of approving this measure, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. All right, it's approved. Uh, then we also have a discussion regarding uh, June 7th, 2018 meeting agenda. And items. then that's just our regular items, just moving to our regular oh, Tuesday okay. items. So do we need to adjourn this so no. part of the meeting? Okay. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. okay. All right, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. How are y'all? Um, to my right is Kelly Malone. She's one of the directors of Four Oaks here in Marion. Um, we're here to give you a, an update on our progress at Four Oaks. It's going to be a very good update. Um, so just to refresh your memory, um, we uh, had some problems at the beginning of the year. We've been uh, working collaboratively with their staff. A commander was assigned as the liaison to Four Oaks. We've held two high-level strategy sessions with all the stakeholders. That's everybody from um, the juvenile authorities to... Um, um, why am I drawing a blank? DHS, Not DHS thank mm -hmm. you. Juvenile Court. Everybody's been in attendance and very supportive of the partnership that we're trying to build. Um, we've done extensive training, had a pretty extensive dialogue between Four Oaks and the, and the officers. Um, we uh, received an, every officer and commander on the Marion Police Department received an hour's worth of uh, orientation from, uh, from Four Oaks staff on how we can better respond better, things that we can do better to uh, handle the incidents if they win when they occur. Um, we also took our uh, command staff and our um, beat officers to Four Oaks, um, got a very in-depth tour um, and overview of the facility, some from, from some of the project managers there themselves. Um, the, uh, from what's happened so far, it is absolutely working, and I'll go to the next slide here. Um, zero incidents in May that required a police report. That, that's huge, and that, I think that speaks volumes to the staff at Four Oaks, not the Marion Police Department. Um, they've made a lot of adjustments. They've really committed to working with us. We had three very minor calls for service. Um, and then uh, I worked with the, uh, and she's the CEO of Four Correct. Oaks, Ann. Um, is it Grunwald? Green, is that the? Greenwald. Greenwald. Oh, I can't. Um, and we uh, co-pinned a editorial to the Gazette. And so just keep, keep in uh, back of your head when, when we're looking at larger legislative issues with the state, how do we support Four Oaks and how do we support legislation that provides more um, support for youth that are in trouble, you know, to get them on the right track before, you know, they hit jail or, or it's too late. When we continue to disinvest and um, make it harder for organizations like Kelly's to do their job, 
um, the police cleaning up on the other end, and that's not what any of us want. So um, I'll be quiet, and I'll let uh, Kelly, if you have anything you'd want to say to counsel or address. Uh. Um, well, I think I spoke last time about the multiple things that we were doing uh, in the program to make things better, so those have just continued, and we're really pleased with the results. Um, I just want to publicly say how much we appreciate uh, Chief McHale in bringing a staff over and doing the tour, and I know on... Uh, Speaking on Anne's behalf, she really appreciated your willingness to pen the uh, editorial. Um, so things are going really well. We have 20 kids there today, um, and things look really good. And you know, moving forward, you know, I think that you know we got it stabilized now. I think there's a huge opportunity for the PD to reach out with, you know, how how they would want to really management. That I want to make my organization available to them to be mentors, um, if they deem appropriate, to maybe do a youth program with them. Um, to really try to engage them. So whatever we can do to support them, um, I'm all in. So any questions? Thank you. Before? Questions? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, are you all at capacity? Um, our capacity right now mm -hmm. is 24. Okay. Um, so we probably fine. will not go up to that number. We're working really hard with the Department of Human Services and Juvenile Court to keep those numbers down a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, there, even though we, I think the last time I was here, I talked about the program being uh, contractually a no eject, no reject contract. Um, but we're trying to uh, work a little bit harder with um, the referrals that come from uh, juvenile court and DHS to really think through the kinds of kids that are coming in the door. Um, and so that's working a little bit better. Um, and we've been talking to Des Moines as well, who's uh, really over all the contracts. So to help us um, uh, stabilize and give us a little bit of relief in terms of the very difficult kids that are um, being referred. And are you at your, are you at your staffing at everything you need? I think last time you were here, you were still doing some training and um, bringing, uh, well, there were some new people. I think that's one of the, the huge improvements. I, I did strengthen the leadership, I made some leadership changes. Um, right now we have a fantastic group of staff. Um, so uh, not only recruitment, but retention becomes really critical in mm -hmm. terms of keeping those um, staff that work so great with you during the difficult day. Great, thank you. Well, thanks to both of you for your efforts. I think it shows how collaboration yeah. and, and problem solving can really yield positive results. So. Yeah. And I know Councilman Draper had some questions on insurance. And I, I do that. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Fully realizing Four Oaks does a lot of really good things. I think to help protect the city, Four Oaks does not have a parental limitation on liability. And I've asked three or four times now for insurance certificates. Two of us have expertise in that area. And I don't think that's too much to ask for. Mm -hmm. So the city of Marion knows that they will be protected by your insurance in the event we have have something really bad happen, mm -hmm. which we could have had one of these sure, incidents. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so if you could carry that back with you, I'd I appreciate will. I that. will. I am not the insurance person, but I will certainly take that back to uh, our CEO. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Council. Um, I'm going to bring uh, Officer Brian Fink um, to the podium now. Um, when I first came to the department, Brian uh, was given a special assignment uh, to look at a, uh, a process called crime-free multi-housing. What it does is it takes a, a more critical look at the way that we uh, manage our uh, multi-dwelling structures as far as a police partnership with the management. And so um, I'm not sure why that's not showing here, but uh, Brian thinks going to take it away for you. Okay. Keep me on task. <laughs> You're fine. Don Cruz here to get where they have more merchandise now. Oh, there's just a little bit. Thank you. 
I'll try to start with Bob who's working on that. But um, I believe this is the first um, Could landmark. you speak into the microphone, do you mind? Oh, yeah. oh yes. Yeah, I believe this is the first uh, landlord or um, uh, pop property management uh, program that Marion has had. And um, this is a pr police propelled or, or presented. And the tagline is keeping illegal activity out of rental property. So I'm excited that we uh, had our first phase one class crime-free training on Tuesday, March 6th of this last year. Uh, it took me a little while. I went to the training about a year ago, a little over a year ago. Uh, we had a pretty good response of uh, 37 property managers registered for that day. And they're registering to listen to seven different speakers at, for eight hours. So it's a pretty good chunk. And they're paying $25 to uh, hear us present. Uh, it was bad weather. So 30 um, of those 37 showed up. And then seven property managers that didn't show up, they actually wanted to register for the next program. Um, two of the property managers that made it through the phase one, they actually want to go on to phase two. So um, I've got a video here that's about five minutes and it'll help you understand the whole program. It's not them. It's a city police call. Um, call in regards to a uh, call you made to us regarding a possible issue you're worried you may have with one of your tenants. A community under siege turns to the crime-free multi-housing program for help. I have lived in a place where there was crime in the area and in the building. People are knocking on my doors all, over, all hours of the night. I can open my window on a bright sunny day and watch someone score a crack right in front of me. It was very dangerous. I got out of there as soon as possible. We knew there were some criminal activities happening on our site and we needed a really positive approach to that. Crime-Free Multi-Housing is an internationally recognized crime prevention program that works to reduce criminal activity on rental properties. This state-of-the-art program benefits tenants, managers, and landlords. The benefits include a stable, more satisfied tenant base, increased demand for rental units, lower maintenance and repair costs, increased property values, and improved personal safety. Crime-free multi-housing provides peace of mind that comes from not having to live in fear of criminal activity. Hello, Crime-Free Multi-Housing. How can I help you? Established locally by the Edmonton Police Service, the Crime-Free Multi-Housing Program has hundreds of fully certified properties. Yeah. And basically you just sand this out a little bit. Yeah. Specially trained police officers work with landlords, managers, and tenants to implement the Crime-Free Multi-Housing Program. The program consists of three phases. In Phase 1... Landlords are invited to attend a two-day workshop that teaches the concepts of creating a crime-free property, including SEPTED. SEPTED, the acronym, it stands for Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. And what we do there is we work with people and we try and modify the behavior so it's less susceptible to crime. And by working on that and changing the environment, sometimes it's, sometimes it's target hardening, sometimes it's increasing lighting and stuff like that. But there's a lot, it's a complex solution to dealing with uh, crime and disorder in a community. Upon completion of the workshop, the crime-free multi-housing trained police officer will conduct a pre-inspection of the property. The pre-inspection will determine what upgrades need to be completed in order to pass the Phase 2 inspection. We'll talk about any issues that they have. We'll Sometimes we'll have just a brief conversation about what they'd like to see us do or if there's any major issues on the site. In Phase 2, the crime-free multi-housing police officer will conduct a thorough inspection of your property. There are nine mandatory components the property must pass to be fully certified. The beauty of crime-free multi-housing is that we have these nine mandatory components. So if you want to participate in this program, you have to bring your building up to a certain acceptable standard. And those standards are set internationally. In Phase 3, the property owner and manager organize a safety social for tenants. A police officer delivers a presentation on the crime-free multi-housing program. The safety social, which is phase three of crime-free multi-housing, enables tenants to come out uh, to a common area, meet with police, discuss some of their uh, ongoing concerns with building safety, but also learn some prevention techniques, which will promote crime prevention within the building, but also elsewhere. We're simply there to spread the message that we are trying to create a crime-free community, and we are trying to make this place safer and more comfortable and more welcoming for people to come 
come home to. It helped me to understand what it's all about. It's a source of information for us, and it's a source for us to give our information to. And so what it's doing is connecting. In order to maintain crime-free status, the property owner must ensure the property passes yearly inspections, organize a safety social every two years, and complete a half-day recertification course every three years. This ensures that the three-way partnership is maintained between property managers, tenants, and police, and that the property meets the standards of being crime-free on an annual basis. It has been a definite benefit for the owner of the property and also the residents living within the building. I feel a lot more secure in this building. I find this property is a huge benefit over others, right, that don't have the crime-free housing project. We don't have to tolerate the crime next door to us. I like being safe in, in my home. Property owners who successfully complete all three phases can post the crime-free multi-housing sign on their property and advertise their membership in the crime-free multi-housing program using the official logo. What we hear from our tenants today is that uh, they are pleased that we have taken a serious response to making our site safe and that they feel safe in their home. And it gives them great comfort to know that all of their neighbours are living a crime-free lifestyle. The number of crime-free multi-housing properties in Edmonton continues to grow as tenants, landlords and managers learn about the many benefits associated with putting a stop to criminal activity in their communities. The program provides fully certified property owners and managers with a residential tenancy addendum agreement for crime-free multi-housing. Tenants sign this document allowing the police to disclose information relating to any police investigation that occurs on or in their property. The crime-free coordinators will provide a support system for evictions if a tenant breaches the contract. As a manager, it gives you great comfort in knowing that if there is an issue, you do have uh, members of the Edmonton Police Service that you can go to for help and guidance in how you handle the situation. Tenants know that the people around them have agreed not to participate in or allow criminal activity on or in their property. This brings peace of mind to new and current tenants because they know that the owners actually care about what is going on in and around their property. To find out more about the crime-free multi-housing program, visit us online at edmontonpolice.ca. So even though it's, uh, it's Canadian, uh, we're very similar to that program. Uh, not the same and the program is also designed to be fit to whatever the needs of the city are large or small so the eight hours was uh, start out with myself I gave the overview um, Michelle Brandt is a property manager that's been in the business for 20 years and she's been certified as an I Iowa crime-free multi-housing trainer uh, she really brings in a connection to the other managers she's probably the hinge pinch hinge pin to this uh, program um, because she can relate to everybody that comes on board. Casey Rigdon is an attorney out of um, uh, Howe's Law Firm in Cedar Rapids. Kim Gordon is on our Civil Rights Commission. Um, she brought in and uh, taught each one, each one of these folks teach areas and so she taught the uh, on how to stay out of discriminating from one to another. We've got James Hancock who's with the police department who helps uh, the property managers identify what is criminal activity, what does uh, drug paraphernalia look like, what does drugs look like, pictures and answers questions. Matt Newhouse comes in with uh, the, reg um, the um, registration of the property managers and the inspections. And then we have the fire department, Sean Flu Fluharty came in and helped with fire inspections. Um, and so Casey, the attorney, would help them go through on how to set up evictions and how to stay clear. So when they came in, uh, we would educate them and help give them confidence in one, communicating with us, and two, fulfilling their duties as a property manager. <coughs> so this is our group here, um, the 30 Marionites, and that is Michelle. They're a lot more attentive in the morning than after lunch. Um, we had hy V uh, bring lunch in for them, which they loved. We kept them there so they wouldn't be able to jet off and do something else. They're all business people and they all have better things to do. So, um, But as I um, 
as I talked to Dean from High V afterwards, he started telling me what the program was about, and he wasn't there. And I asked Dean, I said, how do you know about the program? He says, all these people that are here that came to your class, they all come to eat at High V. And they were so excited about the program, they told him about it. And he had details. Uh, I was surprised. I was amazed. Mm -hmm. But the overall, the overwhelming of these three, 30 people and the seven that didn't come, um, excitement about us organizing something for them, they couldn't believe it. I, they kept saying, I can't believe the city's pouring money into us. Um, I was impressed with this dog. It's a, one of the emotional health dogs. Stayed there like that the entire time, even when there's a cheeseburger right next to her. <laughs> so um, that's uh, Casey Rigdon, the attorney. We had it out at Lau Park, which was a great place. They facilitated us very nice in the Oaks Room. Everything we needed. That's our 30 happy and excited landlords with their certificates. They are all certified uh, phase one. They probably don't know what that means either. <laughs> so the crime free program started in 92 <coughs> and uh, in Mesa, Arizona, because they had such a problem with the uh, uh, crime in the multi level housing units. Um, you know, four to 100, where gangs and high uh, crime rate would um, abound. It took, it just, it went, by 2013, it was 45 states. It went international in 1994. And um, I kind of wonder what Afghanistan's program looks like, <laughs> but there they have it. We have 26 Iowa cities participating in Crime Free here. They're all um, named up there. Uh, it's, I worked with a detective out of West Des Moines who really helped me bring in the program for Iowa because there's Iowa uh, codes that it has to come in line with. And then each city has um, special codes that they have to line up with too. So um, this is the first time I've done this and I'm learning like everybody else is. So uh, the goal is to reduce crime in the rental property, reduce, reduce the fear of the crime and then improve communication. And I would say that this program probably helps communication the most with the police department and the property managers, and it just takes away the barrier that we're just real people. I'm with them in my uniform all day, and they see that I'm just a normal person. So it's a volunteer program where uh, you can register as a landlord, and you can be a part of this program, but you don't have to be a part of this program. So that is it. Does anybody have any questions? That's really awesome. Um, Good. Yeah. Very I would like to just make a comment. I think this is incredible. It's very exciting, especially being in this industry of insuring. We insure these uh, commercial properties uh, for the benefit of rentals. We understand the challenges that they run through. I have a personal family member that's been uh, looking for a home over the last 14 months. She's placed three bids on homes and was outbid on all three of those. And two of the three that she was outbid on turned into be rental homes. So one minute the for sale sign goes down and the for rent sign goes back up. As an individual, it's very discouraging, but it was a sign to me showing that the increased amount of rental property is overwhelming. I don't think we have a clue um, what's turning over in the markets right now, especially that price point um, on those homes, and it's, it's growing, so it's super exciting for me to see this. And I think our residents would like to see it as well, too, because as we see a home go up for sale and the neighbor finds out that it's going to go up as a rental property, um, there's, there has to be some concerns there to some degree um, because that's new for them. And uh, having a plan like this is, I think, going to be incredible. So yeah. kudos to you. Kudos to the department. Uh, Chief, you continue to keep knocking the socks off of all these programs that mm -hmm. are coming to fruition here for us because these are things that we need to be seeing as we're evolving into the city that we are. So all I thank you. All I point, point Brian in the direction, and I just have to give all the – he ran with it. And it's going to be his passion, and he's going to keep it going for us. So thank you, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Absolutely. You can see in the presentation that it's uh, it was done to the best of responsibility. So thank you. Councilman so, so real quick, uh, I mean, again, I think it's a very positive program. Uh, it has another positive impact program by the uh, police department. So uh, I agree with Randy and his comments about that. But is this targeting single-family rental homes or really the multi 
the well, multi residences. Yeah, it's designed for the multi the, the, the larger uh, multi ones, right? Housing, but they've actually brought in to specifically um, kind of conform it and um, to each of the single housing too. So I address that in the program that uh, because the third step is to have a social where the tenant base is educated and we wouldn't have that in a single um, family dwelling. I would just show up and talk with them and talk with them about target hardening and just have maybe a neighborhood watch instead of a, you know, inside the multi-level mm -hmm. housing. Multi -level. So what, what percentage of the multi-family units were represented? Do you have any idea? Yeah, it was a large percent. Okay. Because so that was one of my concerns because um, the, because when it goes for multi-housing and then we present it as multi-housing, I, I had a couple of phone calls from the single family dwellings and I said, come because it's, it's good education for 25 okay. bucks. You get a great right. lunch. And um, so maybe 40% was the first out of 30. Okay. Um, but we, we had some big tenants too. So uh, property, uh, Eagle property, I believe sent uh, a couple other people and it can be okay. anywhere from the owner to the property managers even like we had a, a custodian there. So they, they can all come because the education really reinforces the relationship between us and them. And here to put it in perspective too is it's roughly 4,200 um, rental properties in Marion uh, from our base. So that kind of gives a good perspective. And we got 30 of them. So we got about what, 4,170, 4,170 to go. Mm -hmm. um, so is this, Will you do this on a regular basis? This, this yeah, we're program? set to do it annually. So okay. um, I'll plan again in March. It yeah. seemed to work well then. And um, so once I do the phase one, they'll go through that. And then I try to skim them and get the properties into phase two where I can actually go onto property and do inspections, hmm. uh, like lighting, landscape, and um, locks. Just making sure they have a secure, um, a secure house with uh, shrubbery <coughs> and lights outside, so it'll make the neighborhood look better too. I, I love the proactive approach that we're taking, and not just with this program, but with everything. That yeah. it's. Um, I think the yeah. hardest part was getting him off shift, <laughs> and uh, we'll talk about staffing. If we're going to be proactive, yeah, there's true. so much we can do proactive that is um, to keep it going. And so, as we talk throughout the end of the year, just keep in mind proactive programs. Yeah. I need proactive people. So um, just one more question. I didn't, is the city of Cedar Rapids participating in this or I didn't uh, see their name on your list. So, right. They are not, they did it in, uh, I think 2008, they did it up to 2008 and I kind of put my feelers around for the other programs in the surrounding cities. Um, they ran into a problem because it was, it wasn't volunteer. It was a mandatory. And so then because of the addendum, they ran into some, uh, uh, a suing problem and they got sued for it. So they went oh, from. They made it mandatory. They made it mandatory. That's why I put it in that's a voluntary program. Yeah. But okay. I talked to the officer that was over that program, and she really, it was Christy Hamlin, who's retired now. Sure. She loved the program, yeah. but you have to work the program. And um, they went to a safe CR, which is effective, but it's different than this different program. Different program. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, a lot of the landlords go to both programs because if they have properties here, any town they have properties in, they have, you know, they can or they have to go to that program. Okay. And I, I was overwhelmed with it. I had two or three of them say that our program, the way we ran it was great. And they even said it was better than CR, which I kind of question because, <laughs> but. Well, I, think, cool. I think you're off to a great you start good. and hopefully yeah. annually you'll increase it, increase awareness and, and it can only help. So that's wonderful. Yep. Other thanks, comments? Anybody? I just was gonna say that great program, <coughs> but I'd like to see it. Yeah. Continue into and single that's the family. Key. You got to keep it going. You well, got to single invest family in. is yeah. There's Definitely more and more families. and more like he was saying, single family rentals yep. in Marion. So becoming a lot more concerned by citizens about single family. Yeah, I mean I have two right across the street from yeah. me. So yeah. And you know, from our perspective too, though, I, the the amount of calls for service that come from the big complexes. Understandable. Be, yeah. That absolutely, we'll get on the, yeah. the single family and and, yeah. and grow the program. Yep. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, no. you, sir. Thanks, guys. Okay. One more quick presentation. Appreciate okay. y'all's patience. This one's important, though. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Nick Martins. Nick Martins is a detective in my investigations oh, bureau, but he holds another hat. Nick is the president of the Marion Police Officers Association, mm -hmm. so he is the union president. And uh, he's here today to just uh, educate council 
and talk to council about his role, his peers' role, um, and how he supports the uh, the department as a whole. And so, Nick, welcome. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Hi, City Council. Um, so basically, I'm just here today uh, as kind of an introduction. I know um, the, the union doesn't give a lot of presentations. I've been here for about seven years, a little over seven years, and I don't know if we've ever come up and said, hey, this is who we are. So you guys know that we're a police department. Well, there's actually a little group in there. Uh, it's called the Marion Policeman's Protective Association. So what we are, we have a board of directors. So every year we get together. Um, I pull everyone's teeth and get them to come to a meeting so that they not only nominate people who are going to lead the union, but then also vote on that. So that usually takes about four emails of getting people just to show up somewhere. So um, I'm pretty proud if we can get people to a vote and then people to vote, actually. So we have a, a president, which is myself. Our uh, vice president wanted to be here, but he's uh, currently in sniper school. So he's probably crawling through a bunch of creeks and all muddy. So uh, he couldn't show up. And then Chris Ward, our treasurer, uh, sitting right behind me here. Right. And then we also have a, a secretary, uh, Trent Stotler. So who we represent? Um, basically all non-supervisory employees. So we have 31 officers that we represent. Uh, we have 45 sworn officers, so 31 of the 45 are represented in our union. Uh, eight communications operators, basically anybody in dispatch, we represent them also, and then our records clerk. So kind of what governs us, um, every, usually it's every four years, we go to negotiations with the city and we have uh, this fun little, you know, 30 some pages of our contract, which uh, Chief McHale is going to give you guys a copy of. This just gives us our working conditions. So this determines our, this is our pay scales, this is our time off, uh, this is, you know, what counts as a holiday, uh, stuff like that. So anytime that someone has an issue and says, hey, Chief's being unfair, uh, I go to this document and say, is it in there? And if it's not, then we can't do a whole lot about it. Uh, but we just wanted to get you guys a copy of that just so you can look it over and kind of give us your thoughts. And uh, we're also open to, it'll be next year that we'll, we'll go into negotiations again. But we're always looking for ideas, you know, what can we do to help the city out? What can the city do to help us out? Because I, when I took over the union, kind of one of the things you always hear between union and management is, you know, it's us versus them. That's not the case. You know, we're all, everybody at the police department, we're all police officers. We're working together. We need to work together with the city. I mean, as a, a citizen, I, I don't want, you know, the, the rank and file to clash with the brass, which it's kind of a stereotype that happens. Luckily, we haven't really had that issue since I've been here. Um, and I'd, I'd like to keep it that way. Some of our future concerns, just to kind of touch on this, we'll be giving some presentations later on, but staffing levels, um, I'd, I'm sure the chief has told you, but we, we, we would like some more people. We're getting kind of worn out and uh, we need some help. Uh, we'd like to see some more proactive planning for the future. You know, it's, it's very disheartening to go in every year and say, hey, we need some bodies. But then when that just doesn't happen for whatever reason, then, you know, it, it just kills the morale because we, we kind of hope that it happens and there, there's no plan for the future. So we have no idea what we're going to do four years from now, five years from now. We don't know what the city wants to look like. Th there's no plan. So we'd like to see some kind of plan get in place. I, I know Chief McHale is, is working on that. I'd like you know, the city to back him so we get some, we get some help. Uh, and then just some more planning and preparation. Uh, we'd like to see, sometimes it doesn't always work with budgets and, and all that, and I'm not going to begin to understand all that, but um, I, as an officer, as a citizen, I'd like to see a, a little more proactive approach to things. Uh, why we're here today, short answer, just to introduce ourselves. Uh, you guys, I think I gave one presentation before, but otherwise I, I don't know many of you, so this is kind of a, a short hello. Uh, long answer, we'll be presenting to the council, hopefully every other month, um, on a variety of topics, just to kind of educate you guys, give us our opinion. Now the chief can stand up here all he wants, but it, it's a little bit different, you know, because I'm, I'm at the bottom of the totem pole, he's at the top. So here in the perspective down here is, it sometimes helps. Uh, to get a hold of me, uh, it's pretty easy. Just call 911. <laughs> Usually we show up in just a couple minutes. Shortcut. <laughs> Otherwise, um, here's my information. 
uh, my cell phone, my desk number, my email. Uh, I get to carry a, a work cell phone, so one of those three ways you'll definitely reach me, and I usually have it on me at all times. So if you have any questions, I want to go over anything, um, just let me know. Like I said, we'll, we'll be back. Do uh, you guys have any questions, at least right now? Any, any questions or comments? I think this is great that you've, you've come to just share with us the basics at least and then you plan to come back. I think we need that and um, I, think, I don't think you'll get any argument that we all uh, support having a, a, a long-term personnel plan uh, because it helps us to be able to, to, to plan. I think we all benefit from that having, having um, you know, some planning. So I know the Chief's working on it and he's planning mm -hmm. to present that, but um, uh, we're all looking forward to seeing it. Any questions? Yeah. Hi, Dio. I want to make a couple come, uh, points here. Nick, uh, first of all, thanks to you, your organization. Um, these are all tremendous things. I, and I'm going to echo what the mayor says. I think it's important for us to hear directly from you um, throughout the years as, as changes are taking place. It gives us a perspective, I think, sometimes, too, to um, see things from the street level, so to speak. Um, I've always been an advocate of, of your, you know, the, the forces, so to speak, um, we do get tired, we do get run down. And I think it's great too that you're able to take some of that information back to your peers and your colleagues and share back some of the information that you might get back from council as well too because it's important for them to see the vision. Sometimes if it's not brought down from the hierarchies, um, things are being worked on. It is nice to see the focus and the vision and the scope of, of where the city's going because I think that does a lot for morale. Um, what are your terms for your board members? What uh, are those four-year terms, six-year terms, two-year terms? Every year. Every uh, year. So every year uh, we have a, a meeting and kind of nominate people, and then a month later we meet, and how it works is you can't nominate yourself, so someone else has to nominate you, and someone seconds it, and then you're put on the ballot, and then uh, we vote. Do you have a succession of terms, uh, how many terms that you can serve? And Nope, there's no limit. Nope. Um, usually... People want to do it for about five years, and then they're ready to pass the baton. Perfect. Uh, whether it be through our, our last time, our when I took over, the two guys ahead of me happened to get promoted, so they found a way out. <laughs> <laughs> Once caught, always caught, right? Well, thank you, and, and what you do and, and your board, um, it's important. It's important to us. We appreciate it, and, and myself as well, I'm sure. Um, and thanks on behalf of the City Council for what you do, so thank you. Other, other questions or comments? No. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Council yes. Mayor. Thank you so much. Appreciate sure. the time. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate it a lot. Is that it, Chief? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Safe routes to schools, is that next? Oh, this looks like fire code. I don't, I'm just following James. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right, good evening everybody. Hi. My name is uh, Rachel Schramm and I'm a health educator at Lynn County Public Health. Yes, I need the little projector. Um, and I'm also a resident of Marion, so I live at 5640 Prairie Hill Court in Marion. And um, I am here today just as a representative to come back and just talk a little bit about the Safe Routes to School plan. Um, so if you remember, that includes um, city staff, the police department, the Marion Independent School District, the corridor MPO, and Lynn County Public Health. We worked together for over two years to actually pass the Safe Routes to School plan for the entire district for Marion Independent. Um, and we're very excited about that. So if you remember last fall, it came to your desk and you all approved it. Um, and really what's incorporated in that plan is just a variety of like engineering, education, um, different efforts to really make sure that children within the district are getting safely to and from school. Um, so to support this plan, the work that we had outlined, um, we decided that we would be looking for different grant opportunities, um, especially for creating what we call um, kind of an inter-campus network. So because the district is less than four square miles, actually making a trail connection, that would be a 10-foot wide side path to connect all the schools in the district to make it feel more like a campus. 
um, and just like I said, to get um, kiddos commuting and being on bike, um, you know, especially if you have like a high schooler that needs to drop off a middle school student or whatever, that they have that safe connection. So um, given that the district and the council approved, we went out, we're looking for funding. Um, and actually this February, we stumbled upon a grant opportunity from the Wellmark Foundation. Um, so they had a $100,000 grant opportunity that they really wanted to be for a sustainable project that would really impact the health of Iowans. Um, and they really wanted it to be something that whatever project was funded, that it would um, benefit residents long after the funding was gone. Um, and from our perspective, we really thought, um, you know, creating like this first portion of a side path with these funds would be awesome because it would be something that would be here for decades and really help, help our community. So um, we went ahead and wrote the grant. Um, so really it was Lynn County Public Health and the City of Marion. We worked with Kesha Billings really closely. Um, we asked for funding to support um, kind of this first part of the trail. So right here connecting Vernon Middle School down to 15th. And um, part of that reason that it was chosen was because of the council. Um, we had shown you guys this trail connection and we kind of talked about like what routes would be better. This one would be easier just because of like right away and it's a straight shot. But a lot of you talked about just like the amount of kids that are kind of running willy-nilly from Vernon Middle School and how dangerous it can actually be for them to be crossing the street um, in an unmarked crossing. Um, let's see. So we are thrilled and excited to share that we are funded <laughs> for this proposal. So we're very excited. So we have um, about $98,000 coming our way to Marion, which is awesome. Congratulations. That's Thank cool. you. So here's the but, like I feel like a little girl at Christmas. So as part of this and with many um, public-private grant partnerships, they want to see a match in the community. They want to know that we're supportive of this. So them giving us the close to $100,000, they want it match. The awesome news is that 50% of that match can be um, an in-kind support, and we have that easily between the city, the county, the MPO staff, even some of the um, rapid flashing beacons that have gone in already, we easily top that amount. So um, the only, I don't know, thing that we're really dealing with right now is that we need approximately $49,000 in a cash match just to be secured in writing by um, August 24th of this year. So to fill this gap, um, our work group, um, like I said, is multi multidisciplinary and we're looking at a variety of different funding options, both public and private. Um, so, and we haven't ruled out fundraising to go ahead and secure those funds. So um, basically, um, we're not necessarily making an ask for funding right now, but really we just wanted to let the council know, one, that we got the grant and we're very excited about it, and two, just let you know that like we're looking for $49,000 and um, that we're going to be kind of asking around in the community for those funds. And so we just wanted you guys to be aware if you would hear anything in the community or if you have any ideas. Um, for places that we can go looking. Um, but we're, we're very, very excited about this project. We think, um, you know, just getting this one piece in, we're hoping will kind of be that momentum shift to really make sure that we get the rest of the trail completed. And um, it definitely checks the box of working on our Safe Routes to School plan, checks that, and really just the opportunity to work in the core district of Marion. We're like very excited to be putting funds, funds in there. And obviously just our overall goal, which you guys share, is just really making sure that kids can go safely to and from school. So I guess, I don't know if you guys have any questions for me. Uh, questions. Ra yeah, Rachel, will you go through the, the formula again? You talked about Wellmark wanting a match for this. Yes. There's so already been some in-kind, but then at the end you said you need, there's a lot of in-kind already been done. Yeah. But then yep. you had a $49,000 cash yeah. match needed. How did yep. Work so through that the, again. The numbers, so Walmart is funding us at an amount of $97,686.50. Uh, I accept <laughs> rounding. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah. So 50% of that we can do a match of in-kind. So that can be our salary. Okay. Um, that could be like improvements that have already been made. That is going to be super easy. I think we could probably double or quadruple that. Yeah. It's the other 50% that we have to just show that it's a cash match. Um, and what I think is a little weird, but maybe good, is like literally it's like a sheet that we have to say like this foundation gave us $50,000. That's it. Um, so we just need to show that that support is there by the end of August.
So the total of the project's gonna be roughly about 200,000 then? Yep, about. And how much did the um, MPO provide? So the MPO did a lot of in-kind, so it was actually their staff that had I would say like the idea for the project, it actually came out of Blue Zones and Be Well Marion, so it's kind of carrying this forward. Um, so what you'll see from them is a lot of the in-kind staff support. So they are the ones that actually put together this 100 page report. They're the ones who brought in people to do walk audits. They're the ones who were taking data from the police department, you know, from Officer Dobbs. They were putting all that together. So that would be like our in-kind matches largely coming from them. And what, um, what has Marion Independent contributed? the school district. Sarah, do you want to? Have they put anything toward it? That, well, we're doing some of the updates with that. Um, but could you, could you introduce okay. yourself, please? Oh, Sarah <laughs> Menser with Blue Zones Project and Be Well Marion. Do you need my address? Yes, 2305 Timber Creek Drive in Marion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't have a dollar amount, but their part of this project is a lot of the education enforcement. They're doing the surveys of their mm -hmm. students. Um, they've handled some of the, 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 they're looking at the speed, um, uh, like on Boysen Road that Linmar has when you drive by, I think it's a, it's a those beacons. Solar, yeah, the beacon that tells you what the speed limits are. They're looking at some implementation of those in the district. They have a big part of this because this, this is more than, this is one component to it. But a large part of this is um, changing drop-off and pick-up zones within different mm -hmm. buildings that they have um, where their sidewalks are in. So they have a, we don't have the budget on their financials overall on the Safe Routes to School plan, mm -hmm. but on this project, Chad Zaretsky was a part of this coalition, mm -hmm. so he was part of um, serving other students and s discussing with the superintendent. And I think probably what, what Councilwoman Gadela is uh, trying to Get get to is uh, if there's any potential that they will contribute to that forty nine thousand. Um, we are looking at that, and we have asked them about that, and they are checking okay, so on it in the midst of their ca yes, because mm -hmm. Chad's a, a part of this. Um, okay. But in the midst of their capital campaign that they are just wrapping up, they're also cautious of. They have mm -hmm. some agreements with some mm -hmm. organizations on um, how many times they can go back to them and this current career. Oh, other internal fundraising arms that they have that can right. yeah. because you need this by August, right? I mean, school districts budgets are done a year in advance. So we don't need the cash in hand by August. So they we just need the plan. documentation or like okay. the, yeah, the okay. commitment. And then just for Nick, yeah. and I'm sorry, on MPO, we talked about this. I actually thought that MPO on Marion's behalf, we allocated an ask toward this just our last meeting or, or two. You don't have that the MPO has an actual cash contribution toward it. It's all just in kind. Not that I'm aware of, okay. but I can go back and check. Okay. I'm just curious. I thought that that was one of I the projects that, that yeah. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. That's all I have. It just occurred to me also that we have three new council members since we approved this plan. Oh, okay. I wonder if they would um, benefit from having a copy of the plan. Yeah, sure. I mean, <coughs> I have mine, uh, but. And I can copy it for them, if, but uh, do you have extra copies that you can get to them? Or? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, my, I was going to ask the question on the $200,000. I'm assuming that is a broader reach than just that phase one, widening the sidewalk. No, it is the sidewalk. So uh, that $200,000 is just phase one sidewalk, not doing some of these other outreach areas you're talking about for changing drop-offs? and. That This grant is specifically for phase yeah. one. All, all okay. That money, that yeah, that's how that's how. Um, it's much more expensive, phase one than I would have expected just for that piece. But so, so and this is, we won't try to be Kesha, but I, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> as, um, but I know that she's talked about that there would be potentially some right of way acquisition and oh, I, see. I don't know, Mike, you know. Let me more. let me just back up a little bit for those of you that aren't familiar with it. So basically, Kesha came back a while ago and said, "There's this grant opportunity. Let's apply for it." Um, we didn't realize at the time in the small print that the in kind part of it, that in kind, had to be cash. Is basically the issue that we're in running the, into now. The match. Yep. So yeah. this project here, I don't know what the total dollar amount is. I'm guessing it's four hundred thousand or something. So this is just a small portion of it. And I know there's a discussion. You know, which connectivity do we put in first? And at that point, it was just, let's get the money first. Let's see if we can get the grant. And then we can decide what portion of this project do we actually do. 
um, but the $200,000 isn't going to pay for everything that you see on the screen there. That's only going to pay for a portion of it. And so there's going to be other projects. Um, and then the Safe Routes to School Plan, it's a huge document that has all kinds of things to, to put in there of tabling intersections. We put the rapid flashing beacons in last year um, between the schools on 15th. There's lots of those things, bump outs um, at the intersections. Trees. Yeah, there's, all, there's a whole list of things to do. Um, and so some of that the school is doing, some of it the city is doing. And so this was just a great opportunity that we went after to try and get some of those funds that Kesha went after. So, and I'll add too, phase one I think is, is quite important out of the whole, the whole plan, mostly because right there when the students are getting out of Vernon, they're going down to 3rd Avenue and they're running basically across the street on 15th, which is when the school is in and out, is quite busy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's no, there's no crosswalk, there's nothing there. And this phase one would actually put in a crosswalk and an, an area for them to, to get across 3rd Avenue safely. Phase one is the top circle. Correct, okay. yeah. And, and they're, not even, they're not even using the intersection. I mean, they're just they're running across the street because there is no... Willy-nilly. Yeah, yeah willy there's nothing there. <laughs> So the so education, the education is a big part of this too then. Yeah. It is. And we, you know, when, when this plan was put together, I mean, we literally <coughs> said we walked it ourselves. And, and if you want a fascinating um, look at, at how these kids are moving between these buildings, walk it. And you'll find out you're walking along and then mm -hmm. there's a cr there's, you're supposed to cross there, there's nothing marked or there's no sidewalk on the other side of the street. Mm -hmm. It's just because of how it's developed and at the time it was developed. But it was a big eye opener for that and we also sat out there in cars we had to let the, s the school know if school was with us because people want to know why there's people sitting there staring at the school <laughs> and we watched how these kids came out of the buildings i mean they're cutting between the apartment buildings they're jumping over the walls they're they're making their own cattle paths mm -hmm. whichever is the most convenient for them and by defining this area with the education and being able to put in a set trail system i mean we really would like it to feel like it's a campus with the houses on it and when we surveyed, we surveyed every student and parent as part of this project, it was, why don't you walk or how do you get to school? And a lot of them told us, well, I walk over here and drop off my younger sibling and then I walk to the building I'm at. And we trace those paths on how they do that. And it's not an easy thing for a lot of them to do. And this would really help define that. And I think it tells the community, you know, this is where, this is the safe zone for kids. I mean, this is, if they're on these paths, this is how they can move between these buildings and make it really feel like like a campus and, and, uh, and an open and welcoming um, walkable district. You wouldn't think, but there's a lot of kids that walk from Vernon to the high school. I mean, a lot. It's, it, when school gets out, it's a constant flow of kids walking up 15th to go to the high school. So it's a, it's a really great project, and this is the first phase of it, um, and to get this started and, and keep moving. And we'll continue, I mean, we're continuing to meet, we're continuing to explore opportunities to make this a reality because we're committed to the importance of it, but we, um, we just have to get this, this first piece put together, and um, we're going to be, I said, we're looking for grants, we're looking for opportunities. Um, there's a chance we maybe coming back to say, could you backstop while we continue to look if we can't get the grants in time or what we're looking at, but we're committed to making this happen and we didn't want to be asking because the grant is in the city's name, so any of the matching funds is in the city's name and the last thing we wanted for all of you to hear about is somebody's out asking for grant money um, on behalf of the city for this and, and you didn't know anything about it. We so. appreciate that. And, and so for now, you're not asking for any action from the council, you're not just in informing us. And we might be back for some help okay. to make that deadline a reality, but it's a continuing project that we're seeking funds for. But if we have to meet that deadline, we may be back to say, can you sign for this while we raise the money, but we're continuing to try to raise the money. Keep, keep I, the surprise. Yeah, and I would just, and it might just be me, um, but put this out there that if the city's going to be asked to put a cash donation, you know, toward this project, I would want the, the school district to take at least half of what we're, you know what I mean? Like split it or something of that nature. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't think the whole city, yeah, I just, I think that that would be um, more palatable if it wasn't just the city being asked because the okay. city's also done a lot of in kind and work, et cetera, um, as well. So I, I don't want the whole burden of the what's remaining to just squarely just fall on the city. Yeah, we're really excited and just because we feel like if we can get this $50,000 secured, like just how much funding it's going to leverage and, 
Yeah, well, and I remember hearing um, Marion Independent is the most densely populated school district in the state. I mean, if any district deserves something like this, it's ours. It's Marion. So I think another cool a part. Topic. I mean, we always think about the kids, the kids, the kids. But I mean, this is something that's going to be in Marion for a long time. Yeah. So if we get it in, residents can use it too. So great. Exactly. So thank you guys. Thank you. Good job. Congratulations on the grant. Thank you. Okay. We're finally past page one. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> On to the finance calendar. Under finance, Your Honor, <clears throat> number six is uh, my first one starred. Six and seven are actually related. If you're familiar with the Prospect Metals project, uh, one of the things they're doing is they've negotiated a $2.4 million loan with Cedar Rapids Bank and Trust to help uh, finish construction and operations of the, of the facility. Um, Cedar Rapids Bank and Trust uh, wanted some kind of security, um, of course, for that loan. They've approached Lynn County. They've approached City of Marion. I think it's decided that um, their staff is uh, in council is we're going to split that uh, security. So the public hearing and the following resolution is to um, really uh, guarantee, put a guarantee on that 1.2 million dollar loan um, for this. The, it'd be a 50% uh, up to 1.2 million. We're, of course, Lynn County would be participating in that too if, if need be. Um, it may not be needed, but it's one of those things uh, they wanted it in place. Um, there should be a resolution in your packet, I think, that addresses that. Uh, one thing that it's not in your packet, it does make reference to a side uh, agreement that uh, our bond council is working on uh, today. We talked to them yesterday. Um, that is to put in a provision in there, some kind of a a guarantee to protect the city's uh, investment in this. If for some reason we do have to put forth some of that money up to 1.2 million, we want some guarantees as to how we're going to get that paid back. Um, and I have not seen that side agreement, but hopefully we'll have something tomorrow and you can have a, a review of that before council on Thursday. I provided uh, <coughs> the loan agreement. Uh, should have been handed out. I do have the resolution too. I just didn't make copies for you. I figured that can go in the packet. But if you want a copy of that, I can send that out separately. Or if you what was it? The resolution. Oh, resolution. Okay. I don't know if there'd be any other questions on that item, Your Honor. Or we'll have the hearing on Thursday and then follow that up with the resolution. <laughs> If not, we'll go to uh, number eight, and actually eight and nine are related also. Um, um, just one second, I'm going to turn the gavel over to Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. Right. Just right. Okay. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> uh, we have a development agreement in place for the GLD uh, hotel project. As part of that agreement, there was a financing piece that indicated that the city would be um, uh, basically contributing to the project 30%, uh, 36% of qualifying expenditures, construction costs up to a maximum of 4.5 million. And what this does is this is just the, the financing piece of that to put that in place. So as they start to submit um, reimbursement requests, we can go ahead and, and make those payments. But we'll have a hearing for that again on uh, Thursday and then follow that up with a approving resolution. Any questions on that, Marion? No. Okay. Thanks, Wes. I'll yep. give the gavel back to you, Mayor. Okay. If there's no other questions on the finance calendar, move on to public services. Mm. Is this you, Ryan? Mm. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. I think Tracy reached out to the council to see what dates would work to set a special uh, work session to discuss the projects out at public service. Um, be up to the council on which dates will work for them. And so whatever dates work for you guys, you'll have to set it. Are we going to determine that now or Thursday? Uh, but probably before Thursday. You want to do that? Between these two dates? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like most council members are available on these two dates. So, so you want us to discuss that now? And uh, the I'll leave it up to the council if you want to. You can. I think it's easier since we're all right here. Yeah. Everyone yeah. has their calendars. So any, any preference? 14th is better for me. I, I can't be here on the 19th. 
So it's the 14th for sure then. Oh wait. 14th unless anybody can't. Both are good for me. 14th work for everyone? Good. Yeah. good. 4 p.m. I'll have to move an appointment for work, but that's fine. Yeah. Hey, it's the final watch. It's kind of yeah. important. Yeah. Very good. good. Paul, important. 14th. It be the 19th. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I think it's the 14th. Okay. <coughs> So um, there'll be an actual, there'll be something on the agenda to actually. I'll make sure the agenda is set for the 14th. Move that. Okay. Yep. And I'll get some uh, information out to the council before then. Okay. Chief. Oh. I defer to Fire Marshal Wade Markley, who's going to discuss about the adoption of the new 2018 International Fire Code. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. Uh, the Chief just introduced me, so I don't need to give my name again. Uh, the first thing I want to start out by saying is we presented these amendments to the Building Board um, a couple of weeks ago. They voted to accept all the amendments except what's going to be the first topic that's going to come up, and then, oh, about two-thirds of the way down, there was another one. Uh, those two amendments, they didn't vote nay or against um, or ye in favor of. They just abstained from those two <coughs> topics. So to get moving on, so the first one, which is going to, uh, which created a lot of uh, controversy, um, sorry, um, actually it's my second slide. So operational permits, oh, it is my first one, I'm sorry. Uh, the first issue that we would like to um, bring forward is a permit for um, businesses. And the concern of the um, building board was they felt like this was a decision that the council had to vote on and they really felt like um, it wasn't something that they should deal with. One of their biggest concerns was um, one of the board members felt like um, it could be an additional fee to the business owner that, that uh, might not need to be accrued by them. And as far as the fee goes, my personal opinion and the chief's opinion, I hope I can speak for her, is that uh, we're not looking for a fee to initiate this business permit. But the advantages for the business permit are it really gives us information as to what businesses are coming and going, what hazards they have in the business, uh, the intended use of the business, does the building construction and what they're going to be using the building for meet the, the safety standards that are required for the operation that's going to go on in that business. And right now, quite truthfully, when businesses come and go, we have no idea. Uh, we're getting through most of the businesses uh, every other year. Some of them we do on an annual basis, depending on the hazard. Uh, we're actually having to change some of that and move some of these business inspections out to three years just due to growth and um, lack of staffing to get into these businesses as much as we have been. Um, so we really need some sort of permit system. I know this has been floating around off and on for several years through all the departments. It's my understanding, not to speak for other departments in the city, but um, my understanding is most of them are in favor of some sort of system to track when businesses come and go throughout the city. This is part of the 2018 uh, fire code. It's, it's in there and we're happy to take that task on to get it started and implement some sort of permitting system. There is some work that would need to be done to decide, you know, do we charge up front? Is there a minimal fee uh, for our time and effort? You know, would this be something that needs to be renewed annually? So on and so forth. Um, my personal opinion is I would like to see no upfront fee, um, but I don't make those decisions that's gonna be you guys, finance department, the chief. Um, but I think there would have to be some sort of penalty for people that didn't um, go ahead and get their permit. Otherwise, there's no incentive to, to play ball. So um, before we really move on, this is one of the big ones right to start with. Are there any questions or 
comments that I have a question Wade um, so this is a best practice because you're you're looking through the international codes so most places do have businesses who are registered yes That's most kind of it, it's either through the fire code or building code or a city ordinance that requires either licensing permitting mm -hmm. something that tracks businesses coming into town Okay, and I, I know, I mean, we've had that discussion. I've had it on planning and zoning. We have it now with fire. I think um, when the police, when you presented, Chief, um, recently about knocking on every business's door and saying you're here, it just seems like as we're growing, it would be nice to have this registered system. Well, and I do have to say it, it gives more of a way to provide stats for, for the council and for other entities in sure. the city as to you know, how many businesses are coming and going? You know, do we have a sustained business growth where we have an average of businesses right. staying in the city 10, 20, 30 years? So. How, how will they know about this requirement? How will businesses know? Well, my opinion is we would send out a notice. Um, we would utilize our current business list, wow. our addresses. We would send notices out. I would like to see a year, um, you know, to comply, to start with, to get the ball rolling, or, or a six-month time frame. a new business coming in, how will, how will they know? Yeah. Wouldn't we be able to capture those through the utilities? <clears throat> yeah, the water. water. Water would be a good resource for us. We utilize them quite often now um, because they can't well, be open be without water. There would be some sort of notice to them when they change the utilities or something. You know, some of the, a couple of comments I have is, number one, I have asked the question multiple times over the past decades or two on how many businesses does the city of Marion have. Evidently, nobody knows. We have no way of knowing we, that. Nobody has an answer to that. So I, I have a problem with you trying to mandate a permit on all businesses when we don't even know how many businesses we currently have. And if there's a penalty involved, and you don't even know which businesses to contact or how to contact all of them, it seems that process has some holes in it. And, and then the other question I would have is how are you defining business? If we don't start the process now to answer your first question, we're never going to get to the point we're going to know all the businesses we have. We have to start somewhere. You're saying this is a way to, to be able to answer that question? Yes, yes. Um, and then as far as, I mean, we have a current list for our inspections and everything else. We have some buildings listed as vacant um, that were inspected several years ago, and it's vacant. We've be never been told anybody's in there. When we go by, we see a new business in, uh, we'll set up a time to go in and do an inspection. But if it's someplace we haven't gone by, it's something that we're not inspecting regularly now, it's a residential property that's then been rezoned to commercial, uh, we have no idea that, you know, possibly a business has gone in there or two or three businesses out of one place. We don't know. I think Chief has a comment. Yes, to move this process along, because this is going to be a drawn out thing about business permits, what I would like to see the council do is adopt the amendments to the code, the 2018 code, the other amendments that he's going to be talking about, and exclude the business permit, and we can adopt that at a separate time. Okay. Okay. I'll buy that. Just the businesses, just the 105.1.1? .1 yes, because that seems to be the one with the most controversy. But then we need to make sure we get that on an agenda at some point to discuss and debate it. You know, yeah, because we're Correct. starting. Correct. Yeah. And we will. Okay. We'll come back with if there's going to be a fee schedule, if there's not, we'll sit down with planning and the other departments and get that. Well, I think also it would be worth having the conversation internally with other departments to understand exactly what issues are out there related to not having them, what are the benefits to having them, and be able to kind of have a, a discussion about, you know, why it's important that we do. I mean, I've got a whole handful of them that we've talked about internally, but I think presenting them to the council to understand more about what it provides, the benefit, to the city and, and, you know, if there's any downside to it, obviously, um, fees are never exciting for Never businesses. popular. So, um, I do know that we looked at this a couple of years ago and it's not, in, it's not uncommon to, for, for a city to have a, a permit. 
um, no different than the health department having a permit for um, uh, to run a restaurant. You got to make sure that you're doing things correctly. If the fire department doesn't know what business is doing in a building, they may be doing like the, the biggest one that we get is a paint booth. Um, you know, you smell it, then you find out there's a paint booth, and you know that it's not allowed or it's not meeting building code. There's issues that come along with that, and it's really difficult from the from an enforcement perspective. So someone goes in, let's say they rent a storage facility, and they start painting cars in it. Well, now they've made maybe half halfway through an investment process, and we go in and we shut them down. You know, if, if they would have known there was a license and a process. We're not in a situation we're telling somebody that's just started a business that they now have to shut down their facility is non-code compliant and have to start over. So there are some discussions, but I think if we can bring something back, I think that would be the way to do it. You know, Tom, I would wonder, where is the enforcement? You know, we have all these codes, but how do we enforce them? And I think of a issue I think the chief would remember where we wanted to inspect a building and they locked us out. And, uh, you know, how do you enforce it? That's a, what kind of, how can we help in doing some kind of enforcement? We, when we come into those kind of situations, we refer it to our legal, and then legal takes care of that for us through a municipal infraction and those types of things. In fact, today we uh, shut down a business as a matter of fact, but I'll let legal fill you in on how we do that. All kinds of terrible things. <laughs> <laughs> no, primarily through the municipal infraction. Um, the real teeth in a lot of the municipal infractions uh, comes um, not just from, uh, you know, a specific fine, but uh, that they can be levied <coughs> attorney fees that the city incurs. Uh, one of the important things that we usually seek in these municipal infractions is that we also ask the judge to enter an injunctive order from them to, con to prevent them from continuing the activity. That way, if they do continue in the unlawful activity, then we're able to pursue a contempt remedy against, uh, against the business or individual or whomever. So uh, it, it's sort of a graduated process that, uh, and, and before it even gets to legal, they've, they've always they've been told from multiple times from multiple sources to knock it off. So, uh, you know, really we, we've had a fair amount of success in our municipal infractions when we take them actually over to the courthouse because the judges know a lot of times these people, uh, and it's well documented, the judges know that these people have been given multiple warnings, multiple opportunities to remedy their behavior, and they're just simply at this point choosing not to. Do we have, I think, I think of our condo association. We have 17 pages of you can't do this. We have zero pages of what happens if you do this. You know, do we have things in writing that tell you when they come to you what you're gonna what you're gonna find or how you're gonna handle it? They're they're given notices in writing that says this is the you know Marion ordinance that you are in violation of. You've got so much time or whatever to stop doing this, and we'll send somebody by to verify that you're that you've you know remedied your behavior. And if they've done what they've been told to do, that's the end of it. They're not they're not taken to court. They're not uh, you know the hammer doesn't come down on them again. Uh, by the time I see them, by the time we're actually sitting down in court, uh, they've they've had probably three or four meetings from whether it's you know, the fire department or from Matt Newhouse or whomever saying, you know, hey, are you going to fix this? Are you going to fix this? They've gotten letter after letter. They've had face-to-face -face after face-to-face -face meeting, and they're still persisting it. And we'll have several months of photographs taken of, you know, why they, you know, that shows, well, we went out there in January, and this is what it looked like, and we told, and we gave them this letter. We went back in March, and it, this is the photographs we took in March and the letter we sent them then. And so it is, it, the city of Marion isn't looking to line its coffers by, you know, seeing these people for, for these minute infractions. First of all, it's, 
It's a very serious stuff. Second of all, they've been given multiple opportunities to try and, and fix it at no cost to them. And, and by the time legal action is taken, by the time we really get to serious enforcement, it's pretty clear these people have no intention of, of fixing it any other way. And actually, you're adopting what happens to them when they don't apply. So it, it we do have a written code. It's in that's here. That's what I'm asking. Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah, that's the yes. international fire code. So we're just coming into conformity with national and international standards on that. Anything else with 10511? So, nope. so the motion for Thursday will specifically exclude the Yes, permit. we will sp specifically exclude that. Uh, we'll word it. And just as a procedural matter, maybe the best way to do that to make sure it still comes back up on the agenda for rediscussion is to table it rather than to completely drop it out altogether. Okay, okay but we will be adopting other amendments. Right. Okay. okay. All right. Proceed. Okay. Moving on. Uh, the other four permits we see in there is basically due to growth. We have the amusement building permit. Um, exhibits and trade show permits, mobile food preparation vehicles, and we're looking at an outdoor assembly event permit. Uh, the thought was any group or crowd over 2,000, and most of these permits are truly based on, on safety conditions and safety concerns for life safety, and when you start getting events over 2,000, we really need to know those events are, are up and coming, and as the city grows, we're seeing larger and larger events, we're seeing, you know, potential for all kinds of different things coming to town. W you know, we're getting the hotels and, and convention centers potentially coming. And, you know, so they could be doing exhibits and trade shows. So we want to make sure um, that we're aware of the stuff going on, and that's what the permit does. Any questions on anything else on this slide? Questions? Comments? All right, this is basically construction permits. It uh, has nothing to do with the events or anything else. Uh, with the growth of the city, we're seeing new technologies and new stuff coming in. Uh, battery systems, capacitor, energy storage isn't stuff that we see a lot of now. Um, but with all the solar technologies changing in energy, uh, we thought it would be a good idea since this code is valid for three years to have the availability to have these permits um, available in the system. Uh, emergency responder radio coverage system, that was in the code in 15, except we didn't require a permit for it. And basically what this does, it requires, say, uh, Vernon Middle School. If there's poor radio reception in the school, it requires that you have to have radio coverage. And where this really comes into play for the fire department, obviously, is uh, if there's a fire in the building, our people can have radio communications inside the building to each other as well as from inside to outside the building. Where it comes to play for law enforcement is during an Alice or shooting situation, it allows their officers to communicate inside the structure with each other uh, so they know where everybody is and also communicate with their command staff outside of the structure. Uh, fire pumps and related equipment, the bigger the buildings are getting, the more chances are that fire pumps are going to be required. Fuel cells and power systems, it's, it's the same issue with, with technology and changes in technology. Gas detection systems, we're getting a lot of multifamily structures um, that are requiring um, carbon monoxide detection systems and so on because they have underground parking and so on and so forth. Uh, gates and barricades across fire apparatus roads. Uh, a lot of businesses are going to the powered gates. Uh, access for us is required by code, uh, but for this would allow if they're making changes or putting in a new gate for existing buildings, uh, that they would have to pull a permit for that. So we know that they're changing from the padlock and the chain and going to a motor-driven gate or a code-driven gate so we know to require code access, so we know what that code is. Um, plant extrication, or yeah, extrication systems, 
with all the new stuff with the, the marijuana and the grows and the plants and, and stuff like that. Chances of it coming up to Marion, we don't know, but since this code's good for three years, we wanted to put something in that. A lot of those processes do um, involve volatile processes to extract the different oils and minerals and stuff, so we want to make sure we're on top of that. And once again, the standpipes with the, the building growth and the height of the buildings, anything over store, four stories starts to kick in the standpipe requirements. So we want to make sure that uh, those systems are going in. And it's no different right now. We require a permit for sprinklers. Um, we would require the same thing for standpipe systems. What's a standpipe? Um, basically, oh. on, <laughs> on taller buildings, uh -huh. uh, it would, it's a pipe that would run in the stairwell. Well, we can't pull 800 feet of hose up the stairwells and then stretch oh, it 200 feet and in the they building. Have a wheel on exactly, it. Okay, that's a standpipe. That. So we take our hose up on our shoulder, hook it to the standpipe, and now we just advance that short section of hose to where the fire is. Yeah, Bruce Willis. Fire. Hi, hi. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions there? Uh, so. On 311.2.2, exception three, basically what we want to do is allow the fire code official um, to grant the permission to shut off a sprinkler service in a building if needed. And where this really comes into play right now, Linmar Stadium, for the winter, that's it's a sprinkler b facility. Well, in the winter, they actually take that offline and shut it down. Currently, the code says um, that they can do that only to buildings that are 12,000 square feet or smaller. We just want to take that 12,000 square feet out and if the chief or myself decide it's appropriate, we can give them permission to shut the system down if needed. Uh, residential drives, this, this created a little bit of conversation. I don't think it's going to be a huge issue in the city, but we wanted to add this. Um, we do have huge problems in the counties with these uh, really long lanes and getting a fire truck back to these very large houses down these really long lanes. It's a standard real narrow driveway. The trees are all grown over. And if we can get a fire truck down there, it, it's a miracle. And we just don't want to see that happen in the city limits. But with this code stating that the lane has to be over 100 feet in length, I don't see a lot of you know, city property in the city limits being a, a huge issue. And this would only be for new construction. Um, so we, it would just set some requirements, you know, for, for uh, maintaining the lane so we can get the fire truck down there. It would require certain width so we can get our emergency equipment down there. Uh, there have been several houses in the county. I think there were two last year, almost back to back, that were million plus dollar houses that burn up because they couldn't get the fire trucks back to the property. So addressing. And the current code basically states that uh, addresses, the numbers have to be at least four inches high and a half inch in width. Well, that's great if you're, you know, a hundred feet away or a couple hundred feet away, but you have some of these businesses and, and properties that are way off the lane. So what we would like to do is add an amendment to that, that every 100 feet away from the building, you add uh, an extra inch and a quarter inch of stroke. So the number gets bigger the further away you are from the road. So we can see the address and know where you're at. Now, if you have a sign out front, so the property's here, obviously, this is your sign, this is your number, we wouldn't require it to get, you know, larger because we can see it from the road. Uh, on the last paragraph, it talks about in 7041, unprotected voids and um, joints. It was saying that they don't need to be brought up to code um, <coughs> if, if there's remodels and stuff going on. And this is on smoke barriers and smoke walls. We just want to make sure that that barrier is maintained and updated um, if there's remodeling going on. So. We have that safety factor, and the, the wall does what it's supposed to do. This is kind of the same thing with air ducts. Now, this is the one that the building board also chose uh, not to vote on one way or the other. 
And basically what it, the code says is that for existing buildings, if we have a fire rated wall or a smoke rated wall and you do maintenance, uh, you know, you do a remodel or anything else on the building, you don't have to improve the ducts. So the wall would stop the smoke and fire, but current code requires the fact that you would have um, fire ducts or smoke dampers to keep the fire and smoke from penetrating the wall. Um, obviously, if you have an air duct that's this big and you don't have a damper that shuts, that's a big hole for smoke and fire to go to. So we would like to take that section of the code out and basically, if you do a significant remodel, you would have to um, install the fire ducts and dampers. So that's just a significant remodel or new construction? Yes. Okay. Well, new construction, it would be standard anyway to meet oh, code. Oh, okay. So this brings it so, up to... Yes, it, it would be gotcha. remodels that it would come into play. Any questions there? Their concern was that it's added cost, and it, and it would be, but it's also added safety. Uh, this section of the amendment is basically the building code is already um, there. You have adopted their section of this. Our verbiage is a little bit different, but basically it's staying on uh, residential structures with uh, uh, dwelling units or occupant units of 13 or more. Uh, we would require a uh, 13, NFPA 13 sprinkler system instead of the lesser uh, 13R system. So we're just matching or mirroring the building department's code with this. Exit discharge illumination. Most people don't even know we have exit discharge illumination, so that's why we would like to get rid of it. What it is, it's, it's a light on the outside of an exit door that is battery powered. It's kind of like the emergency lights inside the building, but it's just sitting outside the door. Well. The code requires that you maintain it, that you inspect it, that you service it, and you have to document all this. And when we go to businesses and do inspections, it's a violation almost every time because no one's aware of it. And our feeling is, first of all, these exits have emergency lighting usually on the other side of the door, so you're going to get some light that comes through. And you're outside the building by now. You're in a fairly safe area. And the other thing is, how dark is it really that you can't, is it, you know, totally so dark once you get your feet outside the door you can't see to take another five or six steps to be away from the building? Uh, so we think for a, um, a pot potential cost savings for the business owner um, and also with new construction, if we don't require this, they wouldn't have to put it in. The other thing is they wouldn't have to maintain it if we amended out of the code. And this will match the best practices that are out there? Or is this a Marion? That I don't know. Trying? This would be a Marion. I do not know of any other departments that are doing this, um, but I did not check, honestly. So this is the Marion Fire Department's opinion. We, we kind of threw this around a little bit. Um, if you go to any of your convenience stores, any a lot of these newer businesses, they all have these lights on the outside. And people think it's just the night light. You flip the switch, turns the light on outside. Uh, that's not what it is. It's an emergency light. You'll see a little test button on it. There's batteries that have to be replaced annually to keep them up and running. And uh, our opinion is once you get outside the building, you're in a fairly safe, safe area. And, and it's going to be very rare that it's going to be so dark that you can't see to get to the public way and get away from the building. Well, and nothing's preventing a business owner from putting it up, correct? That's correct. Okay, so from a safety standpoint, y'all are saying it's probably not necessary. I'm yeah. right. well, a lot of businesses have lighted parking lots probably near those exits. Right, and we're not a huge urban mecca with high rises and alleyways that get dark and yeah. shady. Well, and <laughs> where it really would come into play is if you had a storm come through or whatever and you had a blackout or power failure throughout the city. You know, but is it ever so dark that you can't see once you get outside the building? It's, it's a very, very rare occurrence. Everybody's got lights on their phones. You know? I was thinking yeah. the same thing. Everybody oh, just pull out their on. iPhone and <laughs> good point. And if you're running from a building on fire, you're probably not going to look for the door to go back in. Well, yeah. and it's well lit <laughs> by the fire, so. 
<laughs> we encourage you not to go back. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, so with tents, emergency lighting, uh, lit exit signs, all that stuff is required. Um, we would still require the exit signs, but the egress illumination, it's kind of the same thing with the buildings. Um, if the tents are occupied after dark, uh, same thing with all the fireworks tents that are coming and stuff. We do require the nighttime illumination, uh, but it is quite costly for the people to put these up when they know they're going to be closed before dark or the event's going to be over before dark. Uh, so we would like to eliminate that requirement that they have to be there no matter what. Questions? Questions? Thanks for all your work on this. Thank you. I know. Very tedious job going through those, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a committee, and it took us so probably a month and a half. <coughs> yes, it did. <laughs> and just to give you a perspective, in the code, there's 75 permits that the International Fire Code requires. So we eliminated most of them. So we, we do try to make it easier for the city of Marion to do business. So, yeah, it's tedious at its best. Um, just real quick why I'm here, uh, a discussion regarding fire station number three. Um, I would like to move forward with going ahead for a request for qualifications for architect to be designing station three. We're getting very close to choosing maybe a land spot uh, site. Um, so I would just like to get the process going so that when we do choose a site, we will be ready to go. I have a question. Yes. Um, because I know this has come up in the past and then it's just kind of been in the background maybe. So we don't currently have what we want it to look like if we're starting from scratch or do we have anything for Fire Station 3 that we are holding on to and just tweaking? Where are we with? No. We do have... a what we need to function. In other words, we know how many bays we need, we know how many offices we need, we know how many bedrooms we need, we know how, many square, how much square footage we need. So this would just be to get the architect together so once we pick the site, they can make sure that it's going to fit. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Any other concerns Questions about that? that? No. I, I, nope. I think we should be Let's moving go full forth. speed ahead. Yeah. Yes. So will there be <laughs> something to to vote on I on. just want you to direct me to go ahead and request for qualifications to put those out to architects. That will be on the agenda on that Thursday. That will be on the agenda for Thursday. Okay. Okay. A uh, discussion regarding fireworks. I've been contacted by Channel 9. Um, if you saw Channel 9 Friday, I was on there. Um, they have also came by today to talk with me. What the, their concern is is that Cedar Rapids presently has no vendors, firework vendors, in their city and there were no applicants to put up a sales site within the city of Cedar Rapids. And Marion now is up to 23. Last year we had eight. So we've tripled the amount of firework vendors just in the city of Marion. Um, what the news uh, personnel are concerned about, and what, what, at least what they say, is they think that Marion has had this influx due to Cedar Rapids changing their zoning law. If you remember, Cedar Rapids put firework sales only in industrial areas. Presently in Marion, in our city code, it's commercial C3. Therefore, maybe that is the reason for the influx. But that's what the news is trying to portray and put out there, so I just want to make you aware. Um, they're trying to make spins on it. Um, how maybe the city of Mar Marion is benefiting because it increases local option sales tax. Um, it, <laughs> it brings more consumers maybe to the city <laughs> that we normally wouldn't have. So they're trying to put spins on it. Mm -hmm. um, they know that we feel that it's unsafe. Uh, my concern is by having 22 vendors, um, it's putting a big burden on our staff. Um, it takes a lot of time to inspect these to make sure they stay up to code to protect our citizens. So that's my biggest concern. It is taking away from us. Um, the other concern, of course, is having so many. 
um, just puts more of a, a safety. It, it's harder to keep the city safe with that many fireworks <laughs> in such close proximity. So that's my concern with that. Uh, so I just want to make you aware that that's where we are. And so when you see it on the news, don't be surprised. But that's the situation that the city of Marion's in. Um, I would like to maybe after this year, we'll see how this year goes. Uh, maybe we, we may look at wanting to change the zoning also in Marion. Um, for Deb, the sales. I just want to follow up on that because um, Rich from KCRG, we spoke today. Um, yes. I didn't meet him for an interview, which he wanted. I just talked to him on the phone, but he was um, asking those questions about, well, is Marion going to make more money, blah, blah, blah. And I said, as long as people are following the code, staying within the law, I don't, I guess I don't care how many we have. If we don't have a, a number, it's a convenience for citizens and we'll reassess it. Um, after this year, this is a first for all of us, and so yeah, there, there's definitely some some fishing going on. So I'm just putting that out there in case I'm misquoted because I wasn't controversial, which I think they were hoping for. <laughs> you know, it doesn't seem it seems like at this stage compared to a year ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw more around last year. Well, they're not all up. They're not allowed to start till. So the when 15th. can they start? The tents don't go up until the 13th. Yeah. And oh, so the 22 are the 22 including tents? Yes. Okay. Okay. Because I've only seen the one at the plumber. Yeah. That's um, the only one I've seen. Yeah. So far. We Eight have three. 11 tents, I do believe. Okay. okay. That's why I haven't. And the rest are in. Seen so many. Okay. Fixed buildings. Yeah, and I appreciate the update, and I agree with you. Let's see how it goes, and maybe I don't know if, if we're allowed to cap the number, or we change where they're put, or what have you. But we're operating within the regulations that are out there, so that's about all we can do. I know there's quite a few. I shouldn't say quite a few. I have heard of a few nonprofits that are having tents yes. to make money yes. for their nonprofit. But my other That's concern surprising. also yeah. is with 22 vendors, um, we are we did allow use for only one day. Right. So I oh. hope that that doesn't. <laughs> right. So that doesn't change that. I yes. Mean, well, however many uh, vendors there are, it doesn't change the fact that legally they can only be used on one day. Yes. But all the Cedar Correct. Rapids people who can't set off their fireworks exactly. now might just cross the border and then, you know, like that is the Will fear. They be doing it illegally here as long as I mean, oh, come unless on. They're, they're people in the Cedar Rapids, Rapids are still going to do it. They're going to yeah. well, legally either way. <laughs> anyway, I just want to make you aware because the media is making it a big deal. Big, they're so. trying to blow it up. And I just want to make I the agree. council aware of the situation. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Excuse me, council. Um one thing I did want to bring up, this was in response to Councilmember Gedalia's uh, inquiry uh, about capping and things like that. Um, there is currently some significant litigation going on in the state of Iowa by Bellino Fireworks. They have sued uh, the cities of Ankeny, Boone, Johnston, and Pleasant Hill. Uh, Legal is watching these carefully. Um, but uh, this is something that the fireworks lobby is working very hard on. We are going to work on uh, trying to get a uh, memo and brief to council here as soon as we can uh, that picks apart these different cases, but that's certainly something I would like the council to consider whenever it makes any decisions with regard to zoning or fees or anything that, uh, that these issues are being litigated and litigated heavily right now in the state. And just just to follow up, I think from a zoning perspective, when it's all all said and done after the fourth, maybe it's something we'll sit down and analyze what's been done in the other communities and bring it forward to council. But you know, the one of the things that's very difficult on this is that because of the legislation and because of the way the law is written, even though it's impactful to the department, we literally have no way to capture any return. And I think that's a big piece of the legislation that was that, that was a complete failure. Okay. I mean, so we have people that complain when they call in about getting a tent that they have to, they, they actually propose that they don't have to pay a fee for the tent, the tent. And that's our only source of revenue to pay for the cost of having these. So take 200, was it 250 for a tent permit? 50. 50, 50 <laughs> times 50 23. That's the revenue the city's generated to pay for all of the time spent. Actually, only 11. Oh. There's only 11 tents. Oh. 
so fifty dollars so at each. That 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 is a severe problem. Yeah. I think that the legislation has failed to provide, and I think some information to our legislators on that would be very important. Um, so, what what happens if they fail their inspection, their first inspection that well, it's, that's fifty dollars? Well, they're very aware that if they do not uh, abide by the code, that we can close them down. Do you have? Is there a fine for having to come reinspect or anything like that, or no. not allowed? So you could potentially go back four or five times. Well, no. And it's $50. After the first one, there's no charge. If there's a second and third, then we do start charging yeah, okay. for as many times as we go back. It increases. Okay. That's I'll just only for the tent inspection. Yep. Because that's only for the tent. Oh. Because the state legislators voted that we could not. So you could continually have issues and not be able, and continually have to go back and not have any. State penalties? You're not going <laughs> There's th There's state penalties involved, um, yes. but no local penalties. Okay, so the state will benefit if they're not doing it on our dime. Yeah. Well, Got it. So, Ryan, is that something we could consider when we're shaping this after the experience? Again, home rule. I mean, we've got to be able to have some control over what we're going to do here. So, can we, I mean, can you just keep that in mind if there is any leeway that if we need to change inspecting, adding inspecting the fireworks, or that's just state only? It's certainly something we can look at, but uh, first of all, I'm, I'm sure as you're aware, uh, home rule is enshrined in okay. our state constitution, yet uh, for reasons <laughs> that continue to baffle the legal department, it is routinely disregarded both by the state legislature and the state level judiciary. Uh, it's a matter of time before this comes to a serious head about uh, just where, where this stands. Um, it's certainly any time that legal is, is drafting any ordinances, it's, it's something we consider, but we have to take into account uh, the fact that uh, both the legislature uh, seems to disregard home rule on a regular basis and the current manner in which the Iowa Supreme Court is interpreting that home rule uh, make it awfully dicey to uh, just rest on the fact that we've got home rule and this, you know, this new ordinance or whatever we pass, that that it's safe. Okay. Well, for the 20 or 30 people in the room, hopefully you voted today, and when you vote in November, these should be questions you're asking the legislators. Home rule, well, what do you think? What are you going to do? Because we keep getting hamstrung by, you know, anyway. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> no, I, I agree. And I think, you know, you can be talking to the legislators now. Doesn't have to be in November. Ask them at a forum um, when they have a mic. Or call them up. <laughs> Thank you. I think they should be able to defend <laughs> what they're doing. Um, okay. On the engineering calendar. While they're switching the, the prompt, um, were there any questions about the payments? There were quite a few on there. There's about $1.5 million worth of payments we're making out of the engineering department as construction season is in full force. Welcome to spring. I, yeah, I have a question <laughs> about A. Yep. What is it, and I don't know if you have a map. I know you're being put on the spot, so maybe if you could bring it for Thursday if you don't, but what does phase one constitute exactly? Yeah, so like phase one is basically the bridge and how we're going to connect the bridge so it may just be, end up being the bridge, um, and then we might do the grading and the storm sewer and let it sit a year, wait for it to settle. But it's actually, those limits have not been determined yet, other than it's going to start somewhere in the Skogman development north of the bridge, and it's going to end somewhere to the south. What I don't want to do is build the bridge for a short section, um, open it up next to the park, and then close it back down and get people used to using the bridge and then shut it back down. So those limits aren't set yet. But okay. it's basically the first phase of phase the one includes project. construction of the bridge. Yes. Is that the hardest phase because of the bridge? It's the most expensive phase, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not necessarily the hardest because the others when you're doing a signal. 
in an existing intersection, you have to shut that intersection down. So that's going to be more of a traffic impact versus the bridge. We're not, you know, it's on vacant land right now. Okay. So there'll, there'll be signal on 8th? There will be a signal at Marion Boulevard and 7th Avenue. There will be a signal <laughs> at Albernet and um, 8th. Eighth. And there will be a signal at Boyson and Albernet. So there will be three signals as part okay. of this project. Thank okay. you. Uh, okay. So there's no other questions. Uh, then do you have number three? So item number three, four, and five are all related to the same area. So I thought a picture would kind of help to demonstrate what we're actually doing here. So we're removing two stop signs that currently exist, and we're adding two stop signs. So basically the intersection of Winslow, the old Winslow, and Tower Terrace, we're actually building that intersection right now. And that's why Winslow, that section of Winslow is closed. Um, when we open that section, we need north and south traffic to stop because Tower Terrace is going to be the main east-west connector. So that's the, that's F3 is adding those stop signs, stopping north and south traffic so that Tower Terrace would not stop east-west. Then the other is removing the two stop signs that have the circles around them. 35th Avenue will actually go away when Tower Terrace gets built. And Tower Terrace, the center line of it, is that d dashed red line that you see. And so 35th Avenue goes away. So basically you'd have a stop sign that wouldn't stop anybody because that road would no longer exist. The other one is part of um, it's uh, Brookside Drive. And you can kind of see the my mouse went up. So up here there's a street that's going to be built. And this street's going to curve and then tie into Brookside. And then this section of Indian Creek Road is actually going to go away, and that's going to become a trail. So there's no reason to have a stop sign there anymore either. Um, so here's another kind of bigger picture to kind of show you. It's churned a little bit, but this, again, is Brookside, where it comes in. It's going to tie into that section that we just looked at. And then this is Tower Terrace Road. And then this is the existing 35th Avenue that goes away. So I just thought a picture would help yeah. explain that a lot more than just. I, I have a couple items. Um, as this written in item number four, 35th Avenue does not intersect with Indian Creek Road currently. The gravel. The gravel road does. Gravel. No, but that is not 35th Avenue. That is. That's Tower Terrace. It was had the stops. The sign up on it does not say 35th Avenue. That's it Tower says Terrace. Tower Terrace Road. <laughs> I don't know that we have legally changed the name yet. Well, I mean, I'm not. I can't vote for something that doesn't exist. My opinion. The other thing I'd like to talk about is on on Brookside Drive. There's 37 houses in Brookside Drive, 17 of them in the first edition, which would be to the east. If you take that stop sign out of there right now, you've got 16 people in a pull out of there who have the right of way over 100 or 1,000 people on Indian Creek Road. Is there any way you can do that currently if Indian Creek Road remains open? So we're going to do this as part of the project. So we won't take the stop signs out until we close that section. Now, Indian Creek Road, one of the things I've been told all along <coughs> is that Tar Terrace Road is going to be done between Indian Creek Road and the roundabout before we close Indian Creek Road. And I would like further to see a consideration of Indian Creek Road ending at Tower Terrace with a right turn only so you didn't have to go over this way. You could go right to the end of Indian Creek, turn to the right, go out around the roundabout, pick up Lucor, and go to Hunter's Ridge. We are isolating a thousands of people who pay a hell of a lot of taxes, and we have to address this situation. At this point, with approved preliminary plats, I don't know that we can make that modification. Are you saying to leave Indian Creek open? We need Indian Creek open 
and so well, yeah, I'd love to see it open forever, but we definitely need it open until we have the tower terrace done between Indian Creek and the roundabout, because the people, what, how the people are going to get home that come down here in the morning, unless they go over to Winslow, and I can tell you to come to my to come to City Hall. My cell is four miles further going through Hunter's Ridge over to Winslow and down to Indian Creek, where if I can go to the roundabout and down Blair's Ferry to Indian Creek, it would be like a mile and a half further, so it makes a lot of difference. But you have, you know, one of the things we said was that we weren't going to close Lucor, and at the same time, we close Winslow, and here we are right now. We got them both closed. Um, we, the the people who call me, who would be my neighbors who live at Hunter's Ridge, are more than upset. And I, you know, there isn't any way that stop sign can come out of there as long as Indian Creek is open. Correct. And, uh, and this resolution is just setting it so that when we do the project because this is being done, so we, we will be constructing this section of Tower Terrace. They're paving it right now. Then they're going to open up the intersection of Winslow and Tower Terrace. We, and when we do that, we need those two stop signs in there. Yeah. And you're, then going, you're going from 35 mile an hour, uh, you know, the Brookside is 25, and people pulling out of Brookside, actually cars go through there. In the morning, it's kind of a racetrack. If you're on Lucor, and you're driving a little too slow, a guy will turn and go through there and try to beat you down to the stop sign. Happens a lot. And, you know, they have 25 mile an hour through Brookside, 35 on Indian Creek Road. And the people at <coughs> Brookside would have the right of way when they reach Indian Creek Road. Now, the other one needs to be corrected. It's Tower Terrace Road. It is not 35th Avenue. Yeah, we can look at it. I don't that's know that what, the name that's of that. That's what Ryan but. signs say that are up there. But I, I really hope that we can get that section of Tower Terrace Road between Indian Creek Road and the roundabout Cornhenge open before we close Indian Creek Road. Is that, is that a part of the plan, Mike? Or? I didn't think it was. <coughs> it's not I would have to talk to, to Darren on how that's all working just because he's managing that project. We have we have multiple things happening at the same time. But how, how will those residents get out of, of uh, Hunter's Ridge, the ones on the east side of Hunter's Ridge? Um, they could take Lucor to 35th, or they could go take Lucor to um, Tower Terrace and bring Tower Terrace down once it's constructed. Depends on what direction they're going. But if Tower Terrace was done, they and could and take Lucor to the Cornhenge and come right back down and take Indian Creek to the Country Club or wherever they want to go, Uptown Marion instead of going all the way to 7th Avenue and coming down. Uh, 10th, you mean? Yeah. To 10th Street? No. You'd have to go, if you can't go that way, you'd have to, if that's not you done. You mean 35th all the right, way. Right. You'd have to take 35th all the way to 7th Avenue. Or 35th to 29th. Right. Now, when we had the meetings at Indian Creek, when they talked about closing 7th Avenue, not at Indian Creek, at Hunter's Ridge, okay. we talked about having that roadway done before <laughs> so people could get to work at Chamber of Commerce or City Hall or wherever they're going. And we need, I don't know whose job that is, they have it graded between Indian Creek and Cornhenge, um, just like the new one is graded you know, between Winslow and Indian Creek. Yeah, and originally it was supposed to go in last year, but because of the house demos and the contractor and the developer, they didn't get it in. 
Well, but again, when it's a subdivision, we have less control over it versus a city project. You know, pretty okay. soon, I'm going to have to go out to County Home Road and then on Winslow to get home. If we quit, keep doing what we're doing, Hunter's Ridge is going to be a place the fire department can't get to hardly. Ambulance. I'm a little concerned about ambulances lately. Police and fire have any issues with the what you're saying with the roads and the construction and those things? From an access standpoint? We've been adapting to what's happened. Okay. Uh, it is pretty far out of our district. We're, we are traveling to County Home Road to come around at this point. But Adding minutes. Yes, it is. Maybe, maybe okay. we're just adjusting, yeah. Adjusting, okay. Maybe before Thursday we can get with Darren and provide some more answers to the timing on some of that stuff. Does that make sense, Mike? Mm -hmm. And then we can present so there's our, our rationale to. Well, if we had, had you know, some even, idea. Yeah, and a map, show a larger map showing the, the routes. I, I thought it was our goal not to close both Winslow and um, Lucor at the same time. For the local option sales tax projects, yes, but there's also a lot of development that's going on out there. So, for example, as soon as we get Lucor done, for the city project, the subdivision that's building um, to the north of Hunter's Ridge is going to close Lucor but right back down and build that section. But that's not going to isolate neighborhoods. It's north, right? And that'll close it. That's, well, that'll close yeah, the access to yeah, county. It's still going to isolate. Just a county home road. You right. still have residents up there. Yeah, you you can still get down Winslow off County Home Road. You cannot look or because they're working out there. Just let them know that's an so, Tom, I think that's a great idea if we could hear something for Thursday. I, I haven't heard anything, and it's word four, and I'm not saying that people aren't talking. I just I haven't heard anything. I don't know the timeline. I do remember hearing we're not going to close both of those. So maybe understanding with now the new things that have come up, with, is that the Skogman development north of that you're talking about, Hunters yep. Ridge? Yep. Yeah. So maybe, because I know that one's new, um, maybe we can talk about it more once we see the plan. Because right now we're talking and new things have happened since we saw, I think, the last plan and timeline. Yep. That's all right. Progress cannot be in disregard to our citizens. Well, I don't think that's, a, that's the, ever the intent. I think. Um, Sometimes how <coughs> the timing of things that I don't think it's actual disregard. I think it's just sometimes you're put in a position because of the timing of things and how the construction seasons work and you know, it would be unfair to say it's it's disregard. My opinion. Okay. Other questions on those? Items three, four, and five. Number seven. So number seven is just the final consideration of the the speed limit on Albernet Road. Um, the original petitioner may come in on Thursday to address the council. Um, she was a little worried about the timeline that it's taking to get that speed limit um, changed. Um, she's saying that people are now driving 55 instead of 45 out there and just um, was a little disappointed in how fast this is progressing. So she may come in on Thursday to... Does she know that. the final consideration is Thursday? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and so after it's... The, the final consideration is voted on? Uh, then it has to get codified, and I'm not sure how long that takes, and then it's a matter of public service getting out there and getting the signs up. But it has to be codified before the police can enforce it. And I don't know what that process is. <laughs> that means what? Putting it officially in the ordinances? Well, well when, once it gets passed in its final reading, we'll have to get it published. And I think once it's published, then it's enforceable. Once it's published. Okay, so it shouldn't be too long after it's approved. We can tell her that. Yeah, she just feels like it's been dragging on for a while. Well, yeah. Ordinances do. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Okay. Um, if there's no other questions on engineering calendar, move on to the planning calendar. And I see the start item is number two, and I'm going to turn over the gavel to Mayor Pro Tem on this. Wait, there's one before number two. Is there? Yeah. Oh. 1D. I don't know. I'm sorry. 1D is. Oh, I'm looking at my. I'm yeah. looking at Friday. Sorry. Okay. I had my notes on that one. Sorry. Did you get your other hat on? Yeah. Apparently that's. <laughs> oh, I didn't know you were here, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the first item under uh, planning there that's identified is the on Thursday there'll be the public hearing regarding the annexation of uh, the property out near the airport. Um, Kesha put together uh, the report. It's a 100% voluntary request, um, and I don't I don't think there's too much to say about it unless there's specific questions. I wasn't planning to go into much detail. The nice thing about this one is it doesn't drag on for a while it is outside of the two mile jurisdiction and other communities. So uh, once it's approved, it'll get forwarded to the Secretary of State for signature and then it's uh, taken care of once, I believe it has to be recorded before it's official. So it does take some time, but it's not, uh, it's not anything unsurmountable. Do you anticipate people coming? Based, I know you said that you didn't have to notice a lot of people given where it is, but you have you I don't much? suspect that we'll have anybody except for the people behind me that are here now for it. So. Okay. <laughs> Anybody they opposed any? Tom. I didn't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, number 10. I'm going to give the gavel back over to me. If, if I could just speak just quickly. Um, I just wanted the council to know, and I, I like to talk about this, and I won't talk about it in context of any specific item, but I just want the council to see um, when we do uh, annex eight or when we do the final. Sorry, I want to show this. When we do final plats and when we do a number of them on one agenda, I like to just point out kind of where they are and the lots that are there, so you can that are being identified. So you can see across the community on this one agenda, we're authorizing 37 lots uh, at Echo Hill. Authors is going to have 11 lots. Uh, Downing Farms, which is over west of Alburnett, has, got, has nine lots. Now this th this area here, these 33 lots, and I'm I'm going to pull number eight off the agenda. It's not ready yet, but it will be ready for the next agenda. So you can see here, you're talking a substantial amount of lots. And once they're final platted, and I I think most folks are familiar with this, but once the final plat is in, that means their surety poster, the improvements are in. So they are. They are for sale and ready to be sold. So uh, in this one agenda, you're looking at, you know, 30, well, if, if, if Bowman Woods was to stay on, it will be on the next agenda. You're looking at, you know, 75 plus lots that are hitting the market um, in, in, a, in a very short period of time. So thank you for that. I think that's just helpful. Just to and you can see where we're growing. I mean, yep. these are the ongoing developments. So it's just something to kind of think through. Um, and understand as we move things forward. So. I, are we going to talk specifically about the Echo Hill third editions, or should I ask my question now? Like um, you, you, by all means, yeah, you can. So there was, there were some issues with that. Um, I don't even remember how to explain it. There's like some <laughs> weird sliver of land, and there were a couple different developers out there, and I don't know, but I see that it's on here for approval. So did we work that out so that the city, this is good for the city? What we've done is that land issue was um, we've we've allowed the final plat to move forward, but we're reserving a portion of it that is not to be that will not be a part of the final plat until such time there is a there's a, there's a gap that's been established through an illegal subdivision yep. um, that we are holding back to ensure that that occurs. Um, it, that illegal subdivision was done by someone not the owner right. and therefore we are allowing there to be a continuation of the of the platting by the owners to the east um, but it it doesn't harm the city okay. because of what we're providing mm. back on that to okay. ensure that the gap is fulfilled okay so, i just saw it and i'm like this there was a big problem yep. here <laughs> not a legal subdivision it just explain that to yeah me. so <laughs> this has been going on so it's probably been uh, probably 10 years now. Uh, Echo Hill Edition, 
north of Echo Hill School, there's, there was 40 acres out there that were, uh, actually 80 acres were sold. A um, couple of final plats were completed, so the preliminary plat is now locked in. Once you final plat one addition in a preliminary plat, you're locked to that preliminary. And any change to that or any subdivision has to be consistent with the preliminary plat. Well, the project went into foreclosure and uh, the bank got it back. I, I believe the bank got it back. It's been a while. And then it was sold, but when they, when they sold it to a new party, they just sold it because it was 40 acres. There were two 40 acre tracks. They sold the 40 acres based on a parcel and a, sh and a short legal. Well, that was not consistent with the preliminary plat. So it took the preliminary plat and split about 20 lots right down the middle. And so the city has said to them, and you know, I brought it to council a number of different times when there's been proposals to waiver on that uh, by the developer wants a waiver to allow it to proceed, that we want to ensure that the preliminary plat is maintained because if we sell it off, the adjacent property owner now has these long skinny pieces with no uh, platable lot and it just creates a problem. So we've basically, for many years, we sat the two developers down and the owner and the developer and said, you two need to resolve this so we're not doing anything. Um, and finally a developer came and said, we will work with them to proceed in a manner that uh, will protect everyone's interest until that can be resolved. And so we've been working with Kent Bach and Integrity Homes. Um, Bob Butchie uh, and, and his folks were the ones that kind of got everything sideways. So about every year we get a call from them and saying, hey, can we? And it's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, my, that was my question. Where is that at? Do you know? Have, are they still figuring that out? <laughs> figuring that out? They're, you they, don't know? No, I, don't, I don't know at this point. I haven't gotten an update on for some time on it, but yeah. yeah. So we're holding, uh, like the, the new owner can't, we, we've told him you're not final platting until this area is resolved. So. Sorry if that was a longer answer too. <laughs> Number ten. What questions? How are taxes even being paid on that? How is it obviously the assessed? Is that still? Oh, are there, I'm assuming they're current on taxes. Uh, y yes. Um, so it would be because it hasn't been final platted. It's probably still in the ag designation because it's not. Okay. Quote unquote, a lot of record until it's final platted. Okay. Um, so, um, so. So it's going off of old records yet, obviously. So you're gonna. It's being taxed at a very low rate from from. Right. As, as agriculture in the city. Right. Okay. So. I was just a question. Thanks. And actually, that's. I mean, when a lot is final platted, I believe it's 18 months before it kicks in on the new assessment, which is residential, and so that's why you see there's a. That's why I say when these lots are final platted they're going to be developed because the developers have the public improvements in, they're ready to, they want paid, mm -hmm. they're going to start accruing uh, resident, the full residential tax rate on the property. Um, so so on, the, uh, on the assessor's site though, it's probably still showing as a tract and its dimensions are based on what was filed and recorded at that time. So they're only still paying the taxes on what they think they own and not what they actually own, right? Because that's where the line is being they skewed. Own. Well, they, they they know what they own, but they because of the, it's like half lots. Right. So right. in a preliminary, so it hasn't been, those little bitty sec pieces haven't been identified. I can show you better on a plan. Yeah. Oh, that's okay, I don't Yep. Yeah. Hey Tom, yeah, before you move on to number 10, all of those final plats, I had a quick question. Yep. Um, on the second page of each of those reports in red, it's <coughs> not paid as of May 30th or May 31st. Is that something we should be concerned about? Is that atypical? Because um, it was called out in a different colored ink and I thought, well, I want to get paid before I approve anything. Well, is this normal? <laughs> yeah, so the memorandum of agreement is what's attached to the final plat and these are the conditions that are applied and a lot of these are based on city code. Okay. So if an owner does not get all of the improvements in before Thursday, relative to the addition. They have to post surety with the city. They have to get a letter of credit or provide cash mm -hmm. um, to ensure that they're going to be completed. Uh, if weather's bad or contractors can't get lined up, and I think it was that was uh, Bowman Woods Unit 37, they just didn't get enough paving completed. So they'd have to post surety, letter of credit, or cash in the amount of $200,000, I think is what they, so put it off two weeks 
get the paving in, that reduces that down to, it could be nothing if they okay. get all but the we're improvements. fine, because it was, it was like yeah. three to five of the final plats, maybe it's all of them. It yep. shows as not paid in the red ink, and I, it came to my attention, so I just thought I'd yeah, We ask. usually okay. give them a little time to get that taken care of, because this time, I mean, if it would have, if it would have rained for three days last week, we, we probably would have pulled more. <laughs> okay, but no problem. I so just wanted anyway, to find out about yep, that. That's why we like to provide it so you guys can see. Thank you. Any other questions on this? Sorry, what's the next item? Ben? Ben. Seven Hills. Um, so the next two items, public hearing uh, and the, uh, we got a public hearing to vacate a portion of uh, a block and then also to uh, say to sell that so number 10 and 12 are related um, so it's the vacation and sale of a, of, uh, of property north of 8th Avenue between uh, 7th and 8th Street you've got a report on it uh, if you go to the <coughs> last page of the you can see there's so the property is being proposed to be vacated for for development um, and right now, uh, the owner's proposing, he's, he's in a position right now where he's not really wanting to get too much of it out, but he's want, wanting to sh illustrate to the council what he's looking at doing, and that is a commercial mixed-use building, so it would be on 8th Avenue, um, built in the, what I would c consider kind of a four-court design, um, and this is just what he's looking to do. This isn't the plan right now, so it's not like he's pulling the, you know, pulling permits right now. But this is his long-range plan. He actually owns, I believe, the property uh, uh, on the northwest side of the block too. So he's, you know, been acquiring properties in the block and, and will likely come in with a full development plan in the area. So that's kind of why we wanted to, to to put this out there so that uh, council can see. You can see there's, you know, a phase one. He he owns this property too, um, and then you know, ultimate build out could look something like. So which which of the what can you point to everything he owns? I believe he owns this, this. What? So he owns both sides of the yeah, yeah. Both sides. alley. Yep. And intends to develop it all jointly. Correct. Now there were a couple people. I'll just set it up for the public hearing. There were a couple people that were that came to the uh, planning com planning commission meeting during the public hearing and voiced some concerns with closure of the alley onto Eighth Avenue because they uh, I think this gentleman uses it. He comes in and, and drives straight through and exit and because he has a garage back here. Um, so I think that the uh, developer has resolved some of those issues and I believe his uh, interim proposal was until such time as the project was going to move forward. I think he was going to provide uh, better access through there. Um, currently they're in pretty tough shape, the alleys are. So well, They don't maintain it. No. No, the, the, the issue that person has, I believe, and I drove over there, oh. is the alley being vacated is in much, much better shape than the alley on the north side. Okay. Okay, so that is much rougher, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the other one is almost blacktop yeah. and almost finished compared to the other side. So if he's got an issue with it, th their issue is to do something with the alley on the north side. Okay. But he's got access. Yep, absolutely. It's just that it's not as smooth of an access. Absolutely. Yep. So and that was kind of the conversation. The planning commission yeah. was, there's still three ways absolutely. into the property. Yeah. And actually, with the traffic on 8th Avenue, eliminating one access point is probably not a horrible situation, to be honest. So. Exactly. Any other questions on that? The final item, I believe, is the uh, correspondence you've received from Bradley and Riley. Um, what so, about, what about 14? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you have that start. Oh, it, I, that was just—it's a renaming of a little stub street. I don't—I don't know why that got started, but it's a new yeah, yeah. Uh, item number 15 is a, a letter that was received from Dean Spina representing Bradley and Riley. Uh, Mr. Spina is in the audience as is um, Mark Maurer um, representing Platinum Development. Um, 
so the, there's a desire that from uh, the perspective of Platinum to move forward with their final plat. Uh, there were fees established within the memorandum of agreement, which is the document that uh, Ms. Gedalia was just speaking to relative to the final plats. Those are all a part of a subdivision when they go through. Is, um, uh, and, and also there were provisions provided by ordinance to establish hookup fees. Um, so there was, and we've got documentation of forwarding it back and forth, but um, you got a report uh, from uh, uh, Kara regarding uh, the need to go to executive session to discuss this. And I think we would like to do that on Thursday um, after, the, after the regular session, if that would, would work. So we'll have a closed session on Thursday, or if this is what you're asking. Yep, and I don't know if, Brian, you had anything else to say? I guess I didn't have more to add to that. I just, it, the, the item says receive, file, and discuss. Uh, I did discuss this with uh, Mr. Treharn prior to this presentation. Uh, the way that I would propose the city address that is receive and file. If uh, Mr. Spina wants to address the council and give his remarks, certainly listen to those. But I would uh, encourage the council to refrain from um, any comment in open session until we're able to review it in closed session. Okay. So is that... Tonight or Thursday, the comments? That would be Thursday. The comments from Mr. Spina. Oh, um, I don't know whether he intends to address the council tonight or not. Wouldn't that be Thursday? But it's on, it's on our agenda. Oh, oh, it's start. I mean, it's got to. It's on our agenda. I mean, if you're, you're welcome to if you'd like to tonight, or if you can wait till Thursday, too, whatever you like. Thursday, so you, you'd prefer okay. to wait till Thursday. Yeah. That's perfectly That's fine. fine. Okay. Because that was my point. Okay, so any questions on this? All right, so on Thursday we'll receive and file, we'll receive comments, and then we will have... And, and you got a count, copy, the council got a copy of the letter. The, the letter. Correct, yeah. okay. Yep. We do. Okay. Right. Anything else on planning? Nope. Administration. I believe Jen was going to speak to number two. Um, I don't have necessarily anything to provide, but I know I wanted to be here for questions because you guys had questions the first time we presented it to the council. Um, the first time we, the, the difference between then and now. Um, we have pre we presented the exact same retirement plan that has been historically provided for the last 20 some years, um, as is when we gave it to you guys originally. Um, but Lon and I have had a lot of discussions over the last two years about revamping that that whole pl policy and really utilizing it for to better and get a. Um, to really benefit the city a little bit more. Um, and so when we re-ran the final numbers, originally Jeff Schott, when he, when he was proposing that plan, he only compared what was, um, what we were saving on their salary for their own budget for each department. Um, and then not, not utilizing the, putting the money in for what would come out of the benefit fund, which is that 2% in the early retirement plan if you looked at it. Um, so the, the people who are eligible get, you know, a certain amount of health insurance and then the 2% um, for the years of service. So Jeff Schott, apparently, when he would compare it, he would only look at, you know, so if somebody's making 98000 their new replacement will come in at 70000 The difference in the health insurance, this is how much money we're saving. And he didn't compare that 2% because put in that into the configuration because the 2% came out of the benefits fund, which was completely separate. So um, that always proved to show that we had a really good um, reason to do this early <coughs> retirement. Well, since then, just this time, we actually pulled in and we said, well, what are we actually pulling out of the benefit fund? It shouldn't really matter whether it's you know just the department's fund or if it's the benefits. It should and so. We changed it, and, and actually it showed, um, especially because health insurance was going, has been going up. It, a lot of the numbers haven't really com com been compared to, to um, what they were when they first um, 
you know, made this program back then, so, but now they drastically change each year. So we, re, we looked at it again, and instead of offering it to the entire group that we always offered to it, where we would have lost money, we narrowed it down to those top director and manager positions who end up making, you know, a higher um, wage than the people who are in the contract. So you end up still gaining, um, you know, a benefit to the city for, for having those retirements happen. So. Um, I don't know what questions you guys have, but I just kind of want to let you know that we're kind of we're trying to look to use this as more of a strategic plan and not really um, offer it every single year because it also was a it became a um, what am I looking for entitlement almost because when people are like oh I'm not going to take it this year I'll take it next year well every year that you wait we end up losing money we don't get as much you know, benefit back by having you retire at a certain time. And so people at age 65 were re retiring on the early retirement plan, and then we were still giving them payouts, but they weren't retiring early. So we didn't really ever get a true benefit out of them retiring early. So, um, so yeah, we're just changing the plan a little bit. And, and I've worked with the, um, our um, – Lynch Dallas, sorry, <laughs> Lynch Dallas on how to use that strategically and how we can we can target certain classifications and stuff and it doesn't have to just be, you know, everybody in the entire city. So it might look like we're, you know, discriminating if we're saying only managers and super supervisors or something, but actually we can use that and because it's not a um, benefit that we have to offer. It's a it's a benefit that we can just use for strategic planning. So and we hope to get um Amal um, as the assistant too, and then our budget manager more involved in that too to really look at it each year and, and look to what we're going to do. So, um, but so anyway, this is what we've we proposed. We changed it again now to only offer director and supervisors. That really only offers it to three people, um, and we still get a benefit for them retiring. And it also kind of changes some of the organization a little bit too by having some retirements. So. Uh, the, the, the last time this was discussed, we asked to get the details on yeah. the justification, the calculations. Yep. Because again, and when I see these types of programs, yeah. I have a hard time understanding how they really are cost justified. So uh, I've uh, and, at least I've not yet seen the details. Well, we can't really show you the details because well, projections. Um, you got to have some projections to justify it. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, I don't know what we're approving. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I will have to ask, talk to Alon about that a little bit more. But he, I can't remember. Well, it was the same comment I had a month ago. Yeah. When this was talked about. I can't remember. I don't know if you remember his justification why we can't show the exact details. Be because we can't show you that we're projecting like who has family insurance and health insurance. So if you, we give you the exact definition of like. If this person retires, we understand there's assumptions built into it. Yeah, and that's the definition of projections. We understand that. Lon said at the last time at a, at, the, at that request that he was going to send it out. Okay. So I have not. I want to make sure I'm. Anybody else seen it? You and I were both the two components on that, and we. I haven't either. Okay. I just want to make I, sure I didn't. I am not going to support this without that. Yeah. So. Okay. I. I am just like this and breaking these numbers down. I'd like to know a couple things. How do we keep ourselves from adverse selection? I understand there's three people that are offering this. How do we d determine those three? I'd like to know if those projections are calculating pay for performance as we go forward yep. because that is something as well we're discussing and I know there's strong um, opinions about abolishing that or Relooking at that, um, there's a lot of things that are being forecasted in this that are currently being discussed. So I'm, I'm going to sit on the same side with you on this one and, and sure. hold true to that because it seems like when we get to the point where it's convenient, we, we offer these offers. You know, will this be again offered next year, the next year? When we say that it may not be offered again for a while. Those are loose terms to me. Mm -hmm. And I would challenge those in a court of law at any time. Sure. Um, so those are huge concerns that I have and questions I would like answered too as sure. well. 
Um, and I mean, this this is a benefit that's been approved by council like every year for 20 some years. So at this council. Yeah. Uh, no, that's again, and that's exactly it. So that's why we we're we're looking to change it a little bit. But I can tell you what we did was we took everybody's salaries, what the people that we were, well, we took what the original plan was. If you're 55 and have had 15 years of service, and that was like 15 to 20 people, um, and that made you eligible for the old plan as always was. And so we took what your salary is right now, um, and then especially on those contract people, so if you're, if we know exactly what the new person's going to make. So on a contract, you're going to say your, your first person, you're, you're making 60 some thousand, your person and when we're hiring a new equipment operator is going to start at 45,000. So we took that in there. And I, knowing that the per pay performance plan is being changed, um, I was, I did a lot, um, I only did like 3% salary raise in, raises on every single employee as opposed to the five that, that we have right now because I wanted, I knew that we would never probably hit that again. So I did 5% and I projected on the new person um, to, to what the, and what our current employees currently make. So, um, and then what, and then again, we did our standard health insurance goes up by 6% each year. So I also put those in there too. So, um, I don't know what I can tell you because I know he said that we cannot share the details of that. How do we, I'm going to explain well, Maybe on not this. the details as to a particular position or no, person. No, he was going to, he was, he was going to redact the names and people, I mean, information like that, but the, the numbers side of it was going to be in there. I mean, we're not, we're not asking for people's names and all of that. Okay. So he was going to redact certain pieces of it to cover anything that was like that. Yeah. But as far as the calculations and again, early retirement programs just befuddle the heck out of me. I will tell you that right now. And I don't see how companies do it. I have to see the justification for it. I really do. Because otherwise, I have a difficult time making sense out of some of the things that companies have done in the past. And it sure. just knocks my socks off. So uh, you what, got to show me. Whatever it is that, that will you show us show how the city benefits from it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm I mean, wondering. I mean, that's really the bottom there line. A, is there an interest in trading dollars? I don't, is, is there, th this isn't like time sensitive. Uh, no, well, no, I guess we, we have some employees. Well, yeah, no, it's not. I guess it, it's, it's hard for us to vote on something that we can't explain. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think so that's, getting I mean, the that's, numbers that's really and, comes and down moving to. it forward to the next agenda makes sense with the questions that are out here. So if you can, <coughs> yeah. I have, I have one question I want to yeah. ask, Jen. Yeah. Can you tell me, with our self-insurance plan, when those folks take our health benefits and carry those into retirement, mm -hmm. there are claims associated with that. And I'm not talking about their premiums. I'm talking about claims generated in those three years, four years, whatever the agreement is. That comes out of our reserves, correct? Mm -hmm. And those, and how do we forecast those? Well, we don't because they, we only forecast the amount that we're actually paying and that's the premium because they will stay on our plan no matter what. Okay, so, so those claims, yeah, those claims would be ours anyway. Right, so. so if somebody has a heart attack and we incur whatever, whatever our portion of that claim would be for this self reinsurance program, we're not forecasting any of that. So we could. No, because again, we're, that would, we would be paying that whether we, we're only paying the premium, the health insurance premium. Like we pay $1,400 for a family plan. And that's the only part that we, we allow for them to stay on the early retirement. That's the only thing that, that we link and we forecast that and how, how much of that is. Because if, even if we don't pay that, they're going to stay on our plan until they are retired. And so whether they have a heart attack or not, you know, or they're on the early retirement or not, worse, it still comes out of our reserves. Right. Yeah, but that, again, going back to that, though, if somebody was going to retire a year, but yet we offered them a three-year, we're on the hook for two years that we wouldn't have been had we not offered the package to begin with. No, because they can stay, anybody that retires can stay on the plan until they're 65, and it's just how they pay for it, how we pay for the premiums. Okay, so even if they terminate prior to 65 or Medicare eligibility, we allow them to stay on the plan? Yes. I didn't know that. Providing they After pay the yes. premium. Okay. So this goes beyond, we, we don't follow the COBRA guidelines. No, that's, that's beyond COBRA guidelines. Oh, yeah. Right. COBRA guidelines are 18 months. 
right? I understand that. So that's what I'm trying to understand here is, is when claims are filed today, though, what are benefits given to the employees other than their premium? What does the city on the hook for on their health care? So, well, the whole medical plan, I guess. I'm not really... Okay, so there's, I know as a self-reinsurance program, we're, we're paying out of our pool of health insurance to pay for those claims. And you're saying that is not the case. So do they go back to fully, re fully insured plans when they retire? No, no. It's a, I mean, it's, they literally stay on the same plan. So um, it's, the, it's the difference between, um, I guess I don't know if I can better explain that, Beth, Beth if you, I know you know the plan a little bit. Um, Wellmark, um, when we do our renewal, gives a suggested rate that we should fund at. So the employee, when they retire, would have to pay that suggested rate um, once they're out of the early retirement program. Do they pay 100%? After the early retirement program, they would pay 100% of the premium. There is a provision in the state code that governmental entities have to allow their employees to stay on the government's insurance until age 65 at their own cost. At their own cost. Right. But so the city's not subsidizing that at that no, point. No, no, they'd be paying 100%. After they're out of that program, yeah. So that's that's why it's, to compare whether or not, you know, if we offer this, it, it just makes them retire earlier. But they will be on our plan, and if they have a heart attack before 65, no matter what, we'll be on the hook for that. So we don't plan that for into the early retirement because they will. We just do the actual premiums that, like Beth was saying, for their their um, Walmart. Well, if they retire, again, there's so many assumptions built into these types of plans. So if somebody retires early, it doesn't mean that they're going to be paying, they're going to be on the city's plan anyway. They may have a spouse or somebody that has a job where they may take the insurance <laughs> on that side of it. So, I mean, there's no guarantee that the city's going to be paying or they'll still be on the plan. They may or may not. Yeah, but they have the option to do that. I have I've yet to see any retirees that aren't on our plan. I understand. So yeah, but it's but not, yeah. you know. But if if you have a person retire <coughs> at yeah. age 60, and their spouse works somewhere else where they could get health insurance, and most of that is paid by the company, they're not going to be paying 100% of the poly, of the premium just yes. to stay on that plan. Well, and, and the early retirement package does say that if they, they have to come off if they are offered other health insurance. Well, I'm talking, yeah, I understand the early retirement wording, but I'm saying if somebody retires today, not under the early retirement, and they can stay until 65, they would have to pay 100% of the health insurance premium. Right, at a suggested rate. At a suggested rate. But again, if their spouse works, and they only have to pay a much smaller percentage of the premium, they're going to take that policy, not the cities. Sure. Yeah. Well, unless they're, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think that's very slim because, because also that if they're, they retire, then they don't have the ability to come back on their, the retirement plan. So once you come off, you can't come back on. So people rarely ever come off because they want to stay on it till they're age 65. I get what you're saying. Like, like if my spouse has a retirement, but if he wants to retire at the same age as me or shortly after, then we have, and he loses coverage, then we are able to come back onto a plan. So people just rarely do okay, that. Fine. A lot of assumptions. Yeah, there's a lot, and there's a lot of questions. I would like that, uh, you won't have the answer to this, but Yes, There's also I premiums are determined on census, and census is the number of applicable applicants and the number of lives associated to the plan. That's how the premiums are determined. And when we carry those retirees forward, it does impact the premium. And I, unless you can answer that for me, yeah, but we're going to we're going to we're going to move them forward no matter what. I mean, unless there's like one or two random people, which I've never seen. <laughs> That, just, that come off it, um, but I mean, for, for the most sake, they're going to be on our plan until 65, whether we pay for their premium or not. And so the, those costs of what, whatever they have and whatever our premiums are, are built in, and we so we just did we did an average what you know we do an average of six percent increase. So I under I understand that I, I wasn't aware that you guys needed that you would only approve it if you saw that amount. Um, Statement we made 
a month ago. Sure, and yeah, and I'll have to get back with, with Vaughn on that so and see what he um, wants to provide. So I will uh, work on that, absolutely. So, Thank I mean, you. I have, it if, if I, if I, I won't approve it. I don't know how everybody felt. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I will absolutely, um, I mean, I have it now if I know that Lon's approved if I can just take names off and give it to you. So I will check with him and, and see what you guys think. So, okay. Hey, Jen. And so if, if Lon says just, you know, redact the names and send it out, if you could send it out prior to the Friday before the oh, absolutely. meetings, that, you know, just so that we have longer time to digest the numbers. Just yeah. Just time by Thursday. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no, not mm -hmm. by this. I mean, <laughs> next the following yes. two weeks. If, yeah, if I'll, I will it, put it. I'll if if I can die, I will absolutely put it in the memo and stuff for okay. going for it. So, okay, cool. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you. I think we're on to the final item. Final item. Um, that's a number. It's a memorandum of understanding related to Culver Enterprises, and this I, I believe the council heard from uh, Mr. Culver at the last meeting related to a, a TIF project out off of uh, 44th. Um, and this is just a memorandum of understanding establishing uh, a, a five-year 100% um, not to exceed the 286 on the water uh, sprinkler system and then uh, and a two-year 50% on the paper project that I think we went through um, uh, at the last meeting. So that provides for that uh, incentive. I have a question and maybe I missed something or whatever. I remember um, when I think Todd came up and we talked about this and I said, the sprinkler system I get, and I said this about a couple different projects requesting TIF, and I said, but I will lean heavily on the recommendation from the people who make up the committee um, who <coughs> look at TIF agreements and bring them forward. Mm -hmm. but I don't think we ever got that recommendation. I mean, this is on the agenda. Am I jumping ahead of the, does this step come first and then we hear the recommendation or do we not? Yeah, so this, this would be the recommendation that came out of the committee to the council, uh, the, those two items. And the memorandum of understanding uh, would establish the, uh, the first step, and then it would move to a development agreement um, at the time uh, that the district is amended. So, uh, that, so this. That is, that is, I mean, you can assume that that memorandum of understanding is, is An approval, right? approved by the Absolutely. committee yep. that looks at this. And it was for the sprinklers, and what was the other thing that we So that pave, the, they were going to do uh, um, permeable pavers in the parking area um, mm -hmm. associated with the project. So I, I agree with Renee. I, I can certainly understand the aspect for the sprinkler system. Mm -hmm. Can we get maybe some feedback or comments from that group or committee about the permeable pavers? Mm -hmm why that qualifies sure. uh, that that piece of it yeah. is a little more unique or remote for me to understand that one so new correct i mean this we've not done it the first time yeah, that, that is before. correct it's a yeah. new so if we get some feedback on wh how that qualified or what the comments were mm -hmm. sprinkler system where's the public benefit in that yeah, yeah. Right, I think we understand thing. yeah no, permeable pavers not as much okay let me i'll gather that and provide that on thursday if that works so, okay, yeah, that I'd be curious about that one because I, that's a precedent that we would be setting that I definitely want to vigorously defend if I approve, approve it this time. And for right now, it's not a public safety thing. It's mm -hmm. cool, and I know it's better for the environment, and it solves some issues, but um, I want to be careful about all the things we fold under TIF. But does it solve issues? As long as it's maintained, it solves issues, or it could solve an issue. If it's not maintained, well, for water then it does. But it's still, I mean, we've got it over here in our parking lot on the yep. side of the building. But if you look, every time it get a heavy rain, it fills up with water. Mm -hmm. Because it's not being, no offense to the city, but I mean, <laughs> maintained wait, wait, correctly. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, we've got a person in here. <laughs> <laughs> you, are, you are the city. I know. You are not. <laughs> No. So, I mean, and that's the thing. That's the reason of saying, where's the benefit then? Exactly. That's exactly. less of a reason. Yeah. Where, where sprinkler system, when they do their inspections, they're going to make sure the sprinkler system is maintained. Right. Yeah. And and it's, it's certainly, I mean, this is a new, uh, a new um, item that's been included. I, I think it was an option provided by the developer, and it was reviewed. And there were, so it's like an there was a significant, kind of an I'm sorry? 
it's considered kind of an upgrade that, that they may not need to do? Oh, yeah, it's certainly not something that has to occur. Um, okay. the, there's detention provided. So, um, and there was quite a bit of discussion internally on it um, as well. So I'll, I'll gather some thoughts together and, and provide some additional feedback. We have our TIF committee meets tomorrow morning, actually. So. Perfect. So what would happen if it came forward Thursday and the council was in favor of portion, but not? I'm just curious. Yeah, if, I, I think and it was. And I don't a, know where I think it was a, is. I mean, and Mr. Culver could probably address it on Thursday if he wants, but I think it was one of those, it was an option that he was providing. Um, and if it didn't move forward, he would just pave, pave the area in concrete and, and that would just papers. not be included in it. But we, but it, would the whole MOU be thrown out because we'd have to then just have one for the sprinklers if everyone was amenable to that? There's you know already I mean? two separate agreements. Well, it's one agreement with two pro pro two provisions in it. Right, that's oh, what one, I mean. So it's Can just, it, it would be like striking E. Okay. Uh, whatever. And I don't even know that that's going to happen. I was just logistically yep. wondering. But uh, yeah, I'd be very curious to hear the discussion of the, um, why that got included, why that's a good thing. Yep. Yeah, I, I think that's just as a big picture thing. It's an, it's good to be able to, for us to see the public benefit in TIF, in TIF mm -hmm. awards. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Yep. Cool, thanks. Okay, anything else? Is this um, closed session that's on here, the one that we just talked about being on for Thursday, or is this a second item now? Um, this is a separate closed session item. I guess I want to clarify. I'm not recommend. I'm recommending that if Mr. Spina gives his presentation Thursday, I'm recommending that the council not discuss it until they're in closed session. Okay. I'm not recommending that that closed session happen the same day. Oh, well, this, this is a different oh. one. Yes, yeah, I would rather sense. hear Mr. Spina's comments, have time to digest okay. them, and prepare an adequate response. So, if he gives a presentation this Thursday, I would recommend that the closed session that addresses that occur at the next regular next council meeting. Okay. session. Okay. This relates, the one this Thursday relates to, I believe, the land acquisition for firehouse number three. Correct. Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned.